turn your laptop off. Um, you turn your speaker on. Turn, turn your speaker on. It could be your laptop, but let me see here. Um, Danny, do you see Lawrence Freeman? I did see him earlier. Let me go back. I was checking on it, but uh, here I am. There you are, Lawrence. There we Hello. go. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, so about 104 people. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. You could go ahead, continue to send us chat, and we're waiting for all of our panelists to arrive. Thanks for your patience. And um, I think Sorafe was supposed to play music. No. I don't. I don't see him. So. So, um, Danny, is the is the video on uh, speaker mode, right? So when when the speaker comes on, it shows it's it's focused. On, let me see here. Yeah, it should. I was going to actually do that. Yep. Speaker view, right? Yes. Um, as well. Yes. And Anne says she's having trouble getting on. Okay. And she... Anne Garrison. And someone could like uh, if someone has the link, they can put it to her on uh, WhatsApp. It's just that since this is a webinar panel, only the speakers are able to to share the screen. And I don't see her signed on as Ann Garrison. Can you kindly ask her what other name she may have signed on? I have twelve panelists so far, but I don't see Ann Garrison. So thanks everybody for joining. We're waiting for Ann Garrison, our panelists to join. And as soon as she joins, we will start the meeting. Danny, do you see Ann Garrison? Not yet, no. Okay. She said so, she's having trouble getting on. Oh, she completely, okay. Uh, is she trying different devices maybe? I have no idea. I can send her the link, hold on. Yeah, possibly. I just told her that you're sending her the link. Right. And this is probably why I did that one pager for how to log in because people are going to be asking you the last minute. Um, let's see here. So she likes her email. Mm. And I'm sending it to you via your email how to log in. I'm I just a sec. I'm trying to get in. For some reason, it keeps throwing me into Firefox, which I never use. Um, well, let me let me just send you this. So, I, and I, I've got some strange message that says the meeting starts at five thirty. That's yeah. yesterday. That's uh, that's that was, um, yeah. that's Friday night. Okay, I've got the other. I've got the old link. Okay. Yeah. So um, sign on on this one. I just send you the. Okay. okay. Okay, I just got it. I just got it by via email. Okay, yeah, via email okay. and log in. And so as sorry, so sorry, I missed the I missed the rehearsal too. I was trying to find my glasses. It's quite all right. Just log in. Thank okay. you, Anne. Okay, so I'm glad I had that one pager now. So good. So um, it's an exciting webinar we're going to have. About six six hundred and sixty people signed on and actually registered for the event. So it's really really exciting. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that a lot more people log in and we will start. In the meantime, you can actually put any questions you have concerns on the chat and we'll address them. Um, Dina, Walansa, and I are taking, and, and, and Danny, Danny and Amsalo are taking care of the chat as well. And Greg D from Sanctions Skill joined. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay, Greg, I'm gonna allow you to talk and I'm gonna 
also try to see if you can uh, be added to the panelist group as well. So Greg, you're live now. Um, <clears throat> okay, thank you. Let me see if Anne has joined finally. We're waiting for her. Oh, I don't see her. Oh, ZL. Oh, no, that's not her. No. Oh, ZL is Anne. Zima is Anne? Wait a minute. How does she log in with Zima? Uh, I guess let's find out. Just want to say hello to uh, Lawrence Freeman. How are you, sir? Are you still in Addis? No, I got back yesterday. How was it? You know, Addis is a uh, vibrant, lively city. There's construction going up every street corner and people are everywhere and the coffee shops are filled and the restaurants are filled. Uh, and I, every morning I got a, a email or a Twitter from the U.S. Embassy telling me to leave and, <laughs> and, and offering to lend money to pay my ticket. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you did, uh, you did all of us... Uh, favor um, and you spoke the truth. Uh, your presence there, it's like having a million people present in Addis Ababa all saying the same thing you were saying. So yeah, we're um, very, very grateful that uh, you did what you did. Um, the I contrast think, uh, was... I, I think I lost count, but I think I did somewhere between 15 and 16 media interviews, wow. uh, most, uh, including one or two radio and I also, on the last day, was able to give a, a two-hour lecture at Addis Ababa University. Wow. wow. So yeah, probably, I think, probably my State Department is not happy with me. <laughs> no, we were worried they wouldn't let you back in. No. <laughs> I, I, was, I was expecting to meet some people at the airport in immigration. This, this, this meeting is done live on Facebook, so you guys know. Oh, yeah. okay, perfect. Uh, I have no secrets. Sorry. Somebody's asking that. I think Alazar is asking Segei, not, not Alazar, to introduce Segei. Segei, okay. And do we have Anne? I, uh, so. Anne? I don't know. It just doesn't look like it. She was using a different name. Somebody was saying that this is Anne. Zima Lago. That's my cousin's name. I don't know. <laughs> I, I know I've introduced her to her, but I, don't, I, don't I think I just saw in the chat. That you want me to show that video? Yeah. 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 Who's Zima? And I think we have two, two Zimas, so just to make sure that we have the right person. Um, so you know what? We're going to disable the both the Z mask because it's a duplicity and uh, so yeah, I removed one Zima. I only have the other one. So okay. <clears throat> and I'm hoping that's Anne. So we work work that on on the background. I think we should just go and get started. What do you all think? Yeah. The chat says Anne is here. I'm Anne. But it says that under Zima. She's not there. Right. Under ZL. Anne is not there. So for in the interest of time, I think as well, um, and courtesy for those who showed up on time, uh, may I suggest that we, we start? Absolutely. Okay, we are live. And so... <clears throat> I'm going to start recording. Recording in progress. Thank you. 
Thank you everyone and greetings from Ethiopian American Civic Council along with Sanction Skill Coalition. We have a groundbreaking and truly the first of its kind webinar prepared for you. We're joined by our Eritrean American brothers and sisters. You'll get to hear from a group of profound academia, research, lawyer, community, as well as the person who actually co-wrote the AGUA. Um, they'll discuss uh, about the devastating effect of sanctions on poor countries. And when it comes to sanctions and victims are all equal. Uh, before we start, um, and so what we wanna do here is take away how we can collectively uh, fight off sanctions. And before we start, EACC would like to thank um, our Eritrean American leader in San Francisco Bay Area, um, Mr. Alazar Abraham. And if he is here with us, and also uh, uh, Mrs. Ege Namariam and Hewet Namariam, um, we want to thank you so much for initiating this project a couple of months ago with EACC. Um, and if you're there, can you all please greet us? Go ahead, Atol Lazar, you can unmute. Hello, Asquad, and hello, everybody. Uh, it is such an honor to be here and uh, participate in this panel. Uh, we highly appreciate and thank to Asquad that she worked day and night to organize this plan. And uh, we really uh, admire your dedication and uh, commitment to unite all these community members to express their idea and share their knowledge so our community be educated and be aware what's going on around the world and specifically in our region. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you, Atala, much appreciated. And I don't know if it's again, Namariam is here. Um, also, she is one of the great leaders of Eritrean American community in the San Francisco Bay Area. Are you there, Zagay? Yes, yeah, okay. she, she was in, but I think she has a little uh, problem with the connection. Uh, Tigari there. Okay, you can pass. Okay, we can, uh, we can bring her back later. So behind me, I have a picture that my, hus my husband did a couple of years ago that depicts sanction. And sanction, of course, always affects the poor, the children, and the mother becomes the final carrier of such burdens. So I will leave that as a background, as a reminder. And I do believe that we have Lawrence Freeman all the way from Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he may have returned, uh, but uh, he's going to report to us that there's no weapon of mass destruction. And oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think the new name is there's no uh, chaos and destruction in Addis. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Pleasure to be with you. And, are you still in Addis or are you back? No, we uh, we got back uh, Saturday morning. We were there for about uh, 14 days. And how was it? Well, as I've told many of the people I spoke to, uh, as I was saying earlier, I did about 15, 16 interviews and gave a lecture at Addis Ababa University. And for all of you who know Addis in Ethiopia, uh, Addis was Addis. It was lively. Uh, Monday morning traffic jams, as you always have to work through, people at the coffee shops, uh, construction going up on virtually every corner of new office buildings, new hotels. Uh, on Sunday, I went to Unity Park, passed by Unity Park, and mothers were there with their children playing in the park. Uh, so there was no fear, there, there was no hysteria, except coming from the U.S. Embassy, because they would send out a tweet every morning telling everybody to leave and offering to either give them money or loan them money if they didn't have money for a ticket. So they, they were doing their best to create hysteria. Uh, and I brought that out in every uh, interview I did, that this is a psychological warfare. It's a form of warfare, in addition to the warfare on the battlefront. And I told people that uh, there was no place I'd rather be than be an artist uh, defending the people of Ethiopia against this uh, psychological warfare campaign. During the course of, during the course of my stay uh, with the Prime Minister Abiy at the front, 
cities were being liberated. I was we were watching TV when La Bella was announced that it was liberated, which is very dear to my heart because I visited La Bella in April and it was a great experience. And I, I would just add that one of the comments, of course, was translated for me, but that the Prime Minister Abi made on the battlefield was this winning this war is not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is the elimination of poverty. And uh, oh. for me, that's a profound statement. And it's something that I work been working for the last 12 years with people in Ethiopia is that uh, we can eliminate poverty and hunger in Africa. And I also met with some people from the, from the irrigation and development, and we were discussing the potential of yields and increase in arable land and irrigation and how we could make uh, Ethiopia self-sufficient. So I had many discussions um, with people in the diaspora, friends. Uh, I spoke to the government. I tried to encourage them to be more responsive in a more rapid response to the narrative that keeps coming out. I think we're a little bit behind what the TPLF is able to do and what the government of the US and the West is doing. And I think we could do better, the government could do better in responding. So those were several of my discussions as well. All in all, I had a great time, had my uh, full complement of uh, traditional Ethiopian food. And uh, I, all is well in Addis. It may not be in Washington, but it is in Addis. That is fantastic, it's great to hear. Thank you for delivering the great news to the rest of the world. Um, today, your host is going to be Dr. Walansa Asrat, and then Dina Michael Asfa and myself. With that, I will ask to the podium, Dr. Walansa Asrat. Hello, hi everyone. So happy to be here with you guys today. I'm going to be introducing Diagon Yosef Tafari. Uh, Diagon Tafari is chairman of the Ethiopian American Civil Council and also a very successful business owner for over 40 years in Colorado. EACC is the largest and oldest civic organization that advocates for human rights and justice in Ethiopia with over 750,000 subscribers. EACC was the first civic organization to hire lobbying and PR firms to fight the TPLF. Diagon Yosef is a widely regarded expert on Ethiopia and Horn of Africa geopolitics. And one of his notable achievements was he co-wrote the human rights bill, HR 128, and provided congressional testimony. HR 128 passed the US House of Representatives with a unanimous vote the bill supported civil and religious liberties in Ethiopia and condemned the TPLF. He not only has compassion and love for Ethiopia, but also loves and mentors the diaspora community as an ordained minister and spiritual leader at St. Mariam Ethiopian Orthodox Church. He's a proud father of three grown children and lives in Colorado with his beloved wife of 39 years. So please welcome Diagon Yosef Tafari. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Uh, this is truly historic for us. Um, as, uh, as you all noted, that uh, we now uh, have been in existence for over six years. Um, but this particular webinar uh, really uh, stands out as being monumental uh, stage for us, and here is why. Um, the existential threat that's posed to Ethiopia is not something that we can be in an island on our own uh, to fight. Uh, we really need to be more inclusive. We need to partner with the broad coalitions um, and we need to use every available tools on uh, to make sure that our voice is heard. Um, there is nothing like, and then it, it is, and it's, you know, for some of us who have lived here for many, many years, we are a very close community. Um, we really uh, cling on to each other, which is a really a, a, a powerful virtue. But at the same time. In the sea of 300 million plus people, um, and you've seen and witnessed uh, 
the diluge of misinformation by every major uh, media. Um, it is important that we broaden this cause to the larger community, the people who have experienced this, that they've, they've been leaders of conscience for many, many years. <laughs> um, we need to tap into that. Um, and it's very difficult for our community to break out from our own uh, niche uh, and reach out. And uh, I think uh, we're extremely excited um, to, have, to have been joined by great people. Um, Anne Garrison, a phenomenal. I mean, she's just truly uh, opened our eyes um, and felt that uh, we need to be more uh, intuitive and, and, and respond to, to the community at large. And so she became our bridge. I like to say the same to my good friend, uh, uh, Lawrence Freeman. Um, he caught my attention nine months ago when there was a, just an avalanche of demonization against Ethiopia. And to be honest with you, his was the first voice that I heard of reason. And I was just stunned that in fact, there is somebody who, who speaks the truth, dare and have the courage to say it. And he's been with us. And um, I'm so glad uh, Asqual and uh, um, others who have uh, arranged uh, his trip to Ethiopia and to, you know, you heard him, uh, not the world heard him. Uh, once he got to Addis Ababa, um, and maybe we'll do another virtual just, uh, just to share his full scale uh, experience of what he witnessed in, in, in Ethiopia. So I just wanted to say um, EACC is proud um, to open up um, our community to the larger community and it, such as the Sanction Kills Coalition, um, because sanction is immoral. It is illegal. I, I'm not an, a lawyer, but um, but from what I've read, uh, it, it, it has been weaponized uh, against developing countries, in particular Africa. And therefore, uh, there are um, people who have a better experience in dealing with this than us. And I think you're going to hear from uh, a lot of them today. And also, I want to say this, um, you know, uh, AIDS, though it is, addresses a lot of um, vacancies, and particularly of humanitarian assistance, we hate to see AIDS being weaponized. And sanction is in the same way, is weaponized. I remember when Ambassador Samantha Power was, was confirmed by the Senate, um, as, as the leader of the USAID, she said to something to the effect that she will use all the power of USAID to combat and fight China. And obviously you can see from the statement like this, that in fact, such programs are weaponized in such a way, it's fighting the fight that we don't even understand. So, uh, you know, in a, in a, in for a country like Ethiopia, we're probably the most robbed, pillaged people in Africa. Some of you may not know, in fact, in my congressional testimony, I point out the Global Financial Integrity Report that dates up to 2012, that over $30 billion of Ethiopians treasure has been looted out of the country. And these um, funds are deposited in foreign banks, which the United States well aware where they are. And AGOA with a $300 million a year in tax subsidies, if you actually put what we have been robbed, the Ethiopian people who are indebted to this money and still paying for this money, 
uh, that is 30 folds of more money of our own if the United States would be willing to help us and recover those funds. You know, uh, TPLF, and in the most organized way, that parallels a criminal organization known to mankind, if you combine all the monies and treasures that have been looted out of the rest of Africa, TPLF dwarfs the rest of them. I have 30 years to do this. No wonder as a terrorist organization that it is now using those funds to destabilize, demonize Ethiopia, to corrupt the media and maybe some politicians. Therefore, we have something that the world have never had before, which is a terrorist organization. Hello? That is truly the most. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Continue, Anne, can you kindly mute? And so what we have is not only that it is a terrorist organization, it is the wealthiest terrorist organization. No wonder we are being destabilized and demonized. And that money, which belongs to the Ethiopian people, is now used as a war chest against it. And so with all the wrong things that have taken place this year, 2021 will remain as the year that Ethiopia fought half the world led by the United States. It's a really at a year that we will not forget, like we don't forget 1896 when we fought the Italians at the Battle of Adwa. We're not fighting TPLF as an entity. It's the Western powers, which had a long history with Africa, that their racial bias led into the slavery of African descendants, followed by colonialism, then by neocolonialism that we are living today, which the byproduct of that is indeed a Trojan horse like TPLF, to undermine a legitimately elected government and to force us to compromise our sovereignty. So with that, I want to say one last item that is Honestly, Ethiopian American Civic Council have the responsibility and we have to have a wherewithal that we have a dual interest that is of that the United States, our adoptive country that allowed us to come and have an opportunity and the motherland that we call Ethiopia. We wanna have a, between those two countries, an enduring and good relationship. We're not Ethiopian Chinese, we are Ethiopian Americans. Most, many of us have in fact, have been naturalized as a US citizen. So we have a duty to make sure that we bridge the gap. And one of the ways that we suggest to the United States, because President Biden did say that he would put uh, pressure on the warring parties by putting sanction against them. We would like to see the Global Magnitsky Act, in fact, come into, into, uh, into play, sanction TPLF leaders, dig out all the treasures that have been looted from Ethiopia, use that as a good faith and to bridge the damage, the, that has what we have seen in 2021. That's what we like to see. We are beyond asking for a balanced foreign policy because the damage is already done. So um, I, I want to finally recognize some really good people, particularly the young. Uh, you know, I'm an old man and my job is to, rec to recognize the young 
vibrant, passionate uh, activists that are coming. Those who are born in the last 30 years when Ethiopia as a country was not supposed to be viable under TPLF. In that generation, anyone that is born in that generation, today defending Ethiopia, especially in Ethiopia, who are dying as you and I speak. Now, let me ask you, where did they get their love for Ethiopia when they were not supposed to have it? How did they get summoned this passion that is truly the extraordinary virtues that God has bestowed to our people and particularly to the youth. And to make it even more complex is the diaspora, Ethiopian young generation in the diaspora. Like Dina Asfa, she's our panelist. Awet Melach, you did a wonderful dynamic uh, video today for this, this webinar, and many others. And all I want to tell you is this. Forget this, our generation politics that began somewhere in the early 60s. You have an opportunity to define us, our future along with your colleagues in Ethiopia, the base where it matters. And I wanna thank you for your commitment to bring Ethiopia and Eritrea together to make no more, to become the voice for the suffering, not only for Africa, but in the entire world. And for us to say like the Jewish, who, who, who basically after the Holocaust, they termed the word never again. And that word be, em, became embodied and created the state of Israel. We need to say never again for all the things that have ha happened to Africa, in particular to Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's our unity, the unity of Ethiopia and Eritrea that shook up the world shook up every one of these people. And we, it is a sacred union. We're one people with two countries. We will unite, but not only that we will unite, we will unite the region. And we become the true gateway to Africa. So I wanna thank you, sorry for my, apologize for my long windedness about this because I didn't, we did not invite you to hear it from me, but from our illustrate, really illustrious uh, guest uh, we have today. But uh, to start out, I would like to invite Roger Irvin. Roger Irvin is our senior consultant uh, that we uh, retained as a lobbyist, um, extremely knowledgeable person. Um, it takes two page long of his resumes to tell you, but. Um, he was in a position at a time when AGOA was uh, conceived um, to have uh, that drafted along with others. And here is, uh, he is with us, and, and I'd like to invite him to come in to address our, uh, our guest. Thank you again. God bless you. God bless Ethiopia and you, the United States of America. Thank you, Deacon. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Yes. Um, a very eloquent statement. Uh, it, uh, it means a lot and uh, very passionate and, and a lot of foresight in the statement. And thank you. Uh, and it's been a great pleasure of mine to be a, a consultant, uh, an advisor to the EACC for the last four months or so. And it's given me a chance, even though I've worked in Ethiopia on and off for the last 30 years has given me a chance to sort of catch up to what was good is going on in Ethiopia and understand what the, the views are, not only for people who live in Ethiopia, but for you, the diaspora, and what you do every day to support the country and the people there. Um, so thank you for all you do. 
Uh, in terms of the AGOA, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, I think it's a very, very important tool that uh, provides great amount of resources in terms of uh, investment capital, uh, human capital, uh, jobs, and uh, infrastructure capital. Um, and it, is, it has been a fairly successful program uh, for the last 30 years. And uh, um, I'm very glad to be sitting here to talk about it today, even though uh, in terms of what it means for Ethiopia at this moment is not such a great, um, a, a great uh, occurrence. Uh, just, to, just to step back and give you a little history of what, how AGOA came to be about. Uh, four of us uh, young, young staffers in our 20s at the time sat down uh, for lunch one day in 1991 and thought, what, we, what could we do? We were, sorry, I should explain, staff people on the Hill. We all worked for different members on different committees. At the time, I was working for a member of Congress who was on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Representatives. So the four of us sat down uh, and talked about the various issues going on uh, at the time uh, throughout the Congress, not only related to Africa, but international. And trade obviously has been a very important issue for a long time. And many countries have taken advantage of trade preferences to uh, help, um, uh, you know, um, uh, accelerate their economies uh, and become a, a, a larger uh, productive base to export goods to the U.S. and to Europe. Uh, Africa did not have that opportunity at the time. Uh, we were just in the middle uh, at that point of of, uh, of um, enacting uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, NAFTA trade agreement with Canada and Mexico, uh, the Vietnamese Trade Preference Act, the sort of the AGOA for Vietnam was on the table, the AGOA for Chile was on the table, the AGOA, AGOA for several other countries were um, were were being uh, discussed. And, and legislation was being drafted to move on those, but nothing was being done for Africa. So we sat down and, and thought about what would be the best thing to do that uh, would not get um, bogged down in politics, that would not get bogged down in a lot of technical um, jargon, but it would be straight, clean, and simple, and it would provide jobs and, and investment capital for Africa. So we decided we needed to hit... Um, if we're going to write legislation, it needed to be focused on um, a few important things. One was uh, how could we ju uh, justify and quantify the reduction of tariffs on goods that come from Africa to the U.S. that would not be would not make Africa just a pass through for Chinese or or um, you know Singapore or any of these countries that were large manufacturers of uh, clothing and and other um, and other products like that. Uh, two, that it would be that that we would make investment actually happen in Africa, and that it would not just be uh, foreign money coming into Africa and just moving through the process and going back uh, as as profits to those countries and to those. Um, those manufacturers, private manufacturers, and in three, that it would be foolproof from the legislature, the, the Congress coming back year after year and making it a tougher and tougher on Africa, and so that Africa actually could grow into this this process. And so, the first idea was tariffs. How can we make tariffs foolproof uh, on the continent? That that the that production would actually have to exist and that they would have enough capital to expand their economic base and then ship and sell products into the U.S. So we looked at everything that, uh, that any country has done in the past and how they grew their, their manufacturing base. Most countries started with textiles. And textiles was always kind of a third rail back then in this country. So we had to we had to tackle that first. We went and found uh, the cotton um, the cotton manufacturers, the um, the the um, uh, all the uh, textile mills in the, the Carolinas at the time. Uh, we talked to the the Mauritians and the Chinese and others just to understand how they had been using other trade preferences to um, 
you know, to, to spark investment on the continent. And we found that if, in fact, we created a very new way to, um, to uh, provide zero tariffs for certain products in Africa, and we found a way to stop um, what would be called um, uh, 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 um, just, uh, just, just money uh, being used to just you know, build a facility and then move it. So if a facility was built, it had to stay there. And uh, and the people have to be employed, and and profit would have to go to the Africans. So we came up with all of these mechanisms, and it took us unbelievably to say it took ten years to pass this bill. It was almost it was the year two thousand, and we started in nineteen ninety one. But uh, we grew we grew our base of support. Uh, we 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 if we were able to educate Africans so that they understood. You know, or that this was to their advantage. They helped us design programs that would work. They, they found ways in which they could find their own capital to build manufacturing plants so you wouldn't be relying on the Chinese or the Russians or anyone else. And, uh, and we were eventually able to put together a, a very innovative piece of legislation that eventually passed in the year 2000. And since then, and at the time, I had actually moved to South Africa and I was working for the U.S. government. And so uh, one of my first jobs was to introduce people like uh, like Walmart and, and The Gap and all of these uh, these companies to uh, to South African black, you know, black enterprises in South Africa and Southern Africa to see if they could find some way to source uh, they could source materials and, and products. And it became a very, very, um, uh, it, it expanded very quickly in Southern Africa. And then it just moved all the way up the continent to Ethiopia. From what I understand right now, uh, Ethiopia uh, is, um, is, is, uh, has about $300 million worth of revenue annually uh, in, uh, from, the, from AGOA tariff preferences. And uh, a significant amount of uh, investment capital is coming into the country, and it's employing hundreds of thousands of people. So that would I, that's what I would consider a success. Now, there's one there's one sort of um, uh, complication here that's been in the headlines quite a bit in the last few months, and that is the idea that uh, because you believe because the Congress or the, the administration believes that there are human rights violations occurring. Uh, in Ethiopia by the government that um, that there should be sanctions on a go up. Well, number one, uh, that that part of uh, the bill, we fought uh, super hard to not have in the bill the way that it, it was usually put into legislation because we didn't want it to be used as a political weapon against the countries where investment and jobs were occurring. Uh, however, Every single foreign bill, foreign affairs, foreign aid bill that goes through the Congress has a human rights writer on it. So there always has to be some justification, human rights justification made every year uh, for um, for these kinds of bills. And the um, and the, the administration would have to um, would have to investigate and then provide a, a waiver for a country or just just approve that there's no human rights violations uh, occurring. Well, we all know that there was, there has been a significant amount of propaganda about what the government and its allies have been doing or not doing on the ground there. But it was, but it was, um, there was never really been proof that, uh, that that was occurring. Although on the other side, we certainly know uh, through uh, uh, many of the findings that have come up more recently and throughout the, the course of this, this campaign that not only did the TPLF start the, the, the conflict, but in the communities that they, uh, they entered and controlled for a while, that there were vast human rights violations. All those things are starting to come out now, and it justifies every, and it validates everything that, uh, that the EACC and others have been saying for a long time. So the bottom line is, is that there is really no uh, there's really no justification uh, uh, on the table for um, for AGOA to be um, prohibited at this point uh, because um, the, the the one for one reason the administration has just come out and said that they're not going to they're not going to um, uh, uh, nominate um, uh, they're not going to uh, condone 
uh, designating the Ethiopian government as human uh, gross human rights violators. So that's one. So the proof is through the, the government. Number two, uh, most of the, the um, productivity that has been going on in the country has been legal. So there's no legal reason uh, that the, the Ethiopians have been cheating. And number three is, while this conflict is going on, Ethiopia has been benefiting, the, the, across the country has been benefiting from the AGOA preferences. And while, while, while agriculture is down and, and other, other, uh, other um, parts of the economy are not functioning like they should because of the war, AGOA provides much needed capital to people who need the jobs and um, and 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 need the money to take care of their families. So uh, the the position that the EACC has taken is um, the right position. I think uh, I think Angola remains a very very important part of the growth of Africa and certainly for Ethiopia. And it really is important for the EAC and uh, EACC and and um, the diaspora community at large to continue to support this bill and not let. Uh, this administration or any administration use it as a political tool. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. So insightful and we're so honored to have you here. Um, next, our speaker is going to be Anne Garrison. Anne Garrison is a Black Agenda reporter and a contributing editor based in San Francisco Bay Area. She also writes for Counterpunch, San Francisco Bay Area Bayview newspaper, and Black Star News. She reports for KPFA Radio Weekend News and for Pacifica Radio Network's national show, COVID, Race, and Democracy. She received the Victoire Umhosa, in Gaber Umhosa Democracy and Peace Prize for promoting democracy in the African Great Lakes region. She has definitely become a beacon of light for Eritrean Americans and Ethiopian Americans in the diaspora for reporting the truth. And she is uh, a friend in need and a friend indeed. With that, I urge every single one of you here to support her work since she's an independent journalist. And she has um, a Patreon page. Surafel is going to post that on the chat, if you can see it there. Uh, her Patreon page is basically uh, patreon.com forward slash Anne M. Garrison. Um, so we are putting on the chat and I urge everybody to support her. I appreciate that. And also follow her work at Twitter. She is at Anne Garrison. Please welcome Anne Garrison. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for saying all these nice things about me. And I see a friend of mine, James McFadden, whom I know via Pacifica Radio and KPFA Radio here, is asking in the chat, what was the name of the legislation passed in 2000? I believe that is a go of the, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, right? Which we were talking about earlier? Yes. Which Okay, yeah. The African Growth and Opportunity Act. And Biden is threatening to cancel that. It allows... Uh, it manufacturers, manufacturing in Ethiopia to import goods tariff-free to the United States. That doesn't always mean they're Ethiopian-owned businesses. Often they're international manufacturers, but this is helping Ethiopia build up its industrial base. Uh, and it seems that a lot of jobs depend on it. Now, since I said I would talk about media, so first I, I was going to talk about uh, some of the central lies about what's going on in Ethiopia. First, Tigray genocide, genocide against the Tigrayan people, which is a narrative that surfaced almost as soon as the war began, as soon as the TPLF attacked the federal army base in Mikele, within days, the, the word genocide was being used. Uh, first of all, the word genocide is now so overused that it lacks impact. I tend to use the word massacres and sometimes ethnically motivated massacres, which actually has, has more impact, I think, than the word genocide at this point. Uh, the word genocide is used because in international law, it is supposed to trigger a military response. According to international law, the UN Security Council is supposed to meet and 
pass a resolution to create a multilateral force to intervene to stop genocide. Uh, of course, the UN Security Council, as it is now, is not going to do that. Russia and China will block it. But the United States keeps talking about Tigray genocide and talking about designating what's going on in Ethiopia as genocide because they could then use international law as an excuse and say, this is genocide. And because the UN Security Council will not act, we're going to act. So this is a big lie and that's the motivation behind it. And I think the word is overused anymore, anyway uh, at this point. And John Philpot and I have talked about that a number of times and he may mention it in his remarks. Uh, another big lie has been that the TPLF are on the road to Addis and the city may fall. We heard that over and over again for probably a month. <laughs> and until it became obviously not true when the Ethiopian army retook several key towns, Desi and Kambosha and possibly Lalibela. I'm not sure about Lalibela because right now, uh, Al Shazira, The Guardian, Reuters, Yahoo News, and the South China Morning Post, AFP, and the BBC are all reporting that the TPLF has retaken Lalibela. We don't know yet whether or not this is more uh, propaganda. But in any case, the TPLF are not at Addis's doorstep, and this seemed to have been used. This particular propaganda was trying to scare people into fleeing, um, fleeing Addis, <laughs> including Lawrence Freeman, who refused to be scared, as uh, most of the residents of the city did, so far as I understand. Um, another is... There is no military solution. You keep hearing this over and over. So-and-so said there's no military solution. Samantha Power, Antony Blinken, Brad Sherman, et cetera. There's no military solution. Well, for one, since when is it news that some politicians said blah, blah, blah? <laughs> but what this means, of course, is that Blinken Power, probably Susan Rice in the background, are determined that the U.S. continue to dominate Ethiopia and the Horn, and no military solution uh, sounds good, and unconditional surrender, which is a real demand, uh, may sound good if you don't stop and think about it. Um, now, Brad Sherman, the House Rep from the 30th District of, of California, whom everyone knows has been very, very aggressive, uh, even wants to block the ports, the ports on the Red Sea, the Eritrean ports on the Red Sea, which could create a log jam that would make the boat that got stuck in the, in the Suez Canal last year look like a picnic, given that the U.S., France, and China all have a military base there in Djibouti. Anyway, Brad Sherman is essentially a lobbyist for Lockheed Martin. He was preceded by Adam Schiff, who was also and still is a lobbyist for Lockheed Martin and the military industrial complex. So it's important to understand that this is structural. The propaganda that you hear from Brad Sherman and a whole lot of the rest of it, he is just a particularly vocal uh, lobbyist. This is structural uh, because he represents the military industrial complex, which wants to start US wars wherever it can. In fact, uh, the military industrial complex, military weapons manufacturers spend more money on lobbyists in Washington, D.C. than they spend on political campaigns. And they spend generously on political campaigns. That means there are lobbyists who wake up every morning in Washington, D.C., get on the phone and lobby for war. <laughs> and they're always looking, Lockheed Martin is always looking for another excuse to manufacture cruise missiles. It, the U.S. dropped so many cruise missiles on Syria that Lockheed Martin had to go into emergency production. So this is structural. The military industrial complex is a structural motivation in American political life. Uh, Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman wrote in their uh, classic book, Manufacturing Consent, that the, the weapons manufacturers have placed facilities, manufacturing facilities, 
in every state in the union so that they have a constituency in every single state in the union. Uh, so that's formidable, it's structural, but it's best to admit what we're up against. Now, the other structural thing behind this and behind all the media lies is that the government represents corporations and oligarchs, not people. So it's going to represent whatever corporations conceive as their interests. Uh, at this point, and I'm constantly thinking about this, but at this point, I think that the military industrial motivation may even be in the lead because I think U.S. corporations, for example, will go back into Afghanistan even though U.S. troops have departed. Um, and I believe what Julian Assange said about the Afghanistan war, that it was a way of uh, laundering money into the hands of global weapons manufacturers and a transnational security elite. Uh, but whichever is in the lead, these two motivations, corporate and military profit, drive US foreign policy. And I'm not someone who's so extreme that I'm opposed to small business or uh, any sort of business that is not uh, feeding at the public trough and stealing national resources from making a profit. Uh, I am, I would say I'm a socialist insofar as I think that uh, natural resources like energy resources, oil and gas and whatever else, uh, mineral resources, uh, the hydroelectric, hydroelectric power uh, in, in Ethiopia should be national resources. And a lot of global corporations do not. Okay, so that's structural again. And the media is owned by corporations and oligarchs uh, and even state media here like NPR depend on corporate advertising and are therefore essentially corporate owned. So this is structural. I know it's daunting to challenge the very structure of American society, but I think it's important to start by understanding uh, that this aggression towards Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the Horn, the whole continent of Africa is structural. Uh, and, and that it's happening because these are the people, it, you know, corporate interests, including, you know, the mega corporations that include military industrial interests own the media. Okay, now about the activism around the media. Uh, I was... I was at a demonstration in San Francisco recently, and the main theme of that demonstration was criticizing CNN. There were a lot of signs and a lot of chants of CNN, fake news, CNN, fake news. <laughs> and when they asked me to say a word, a few words, I suggested another chant, which was CNN, turn it off. <laughs> CNN, turn it off. Uh, CNN is dying because as is the rest of cable news, because young people prefer web-based media, often web-based media on demand. Uh, so its audience is slowly going to fade away. Now, instead of putting so much energy into chanting that CNN is fake news and demonstrating outside CNN, I think that's fine. But I, I think it's important not to put inordinate energy into that so at the next demonstration, you might consider chanting after CNN fake news, CNN, turn it off. Black Agenda Report speaks truth to power. The gray zone exposes corporate greed and corruption. Covert action tells it like it is. Mint Press News gets it right. And those are just a few of the independent publications that are not beholden to weapons manufacturers and big corporate interests uh, who have the freedom to tell the truth. And with regard to what Asqual said about supporting my independent reporting, most of these outlets survive on fund drives and the fund drives typically raise just isn't enough money to have an editor, maybe a copy editor, maybe some technological help because most of them are web-based. Uh, so, they have their own fund drives, their own Patreon pages, and so do most of the writers. 
Uh, and the consequence is that we have the independence to tell the truth. Uh, and oh, the last thing I wanted to say was something about the media and sanctions. Uh, sanctions can be used to punish a, a country like they are Ethiopia. They can also be used to create illusions. This was true in Rwanda in 2012, 2013. Rwanda, excuse me. Rwanda was behind the M23 war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was just devastating in 2012 and 2013. And in or Rwanda is a US ally and serves basically as its army in the region and elsewhere on the continent as Ethiopia did for a while under the TPLF uh, to make it look as though they were concerned about this and as though they were doing something about it, the US imposed some trivial, meaningless sanctions on Rwanda, like they reduced the funding for uh, a military academy, nothing that was going to have any significant impact. So everything, as Deacon Yosef said, can be weaponized and propagandized and it's important to see that sanctions not only punish, they can serve propaganda purposes and whatever the worst impulses of US foreign policy are. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me? Yep, I yes. will mute now. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was very informative, and I really appreciate that you mentioned that what can we do as far as actionable items, which is support the ones that are actually telling the truth. You know, having been assaulted for this year with these lies that has been so disturbing to all of us, that's one of the things I've started thinking about is what could we do? We could support you on Patreon and Garrison also other, uh, you mentioned Mint Free Press, uh, Counterpunch wrote a very honest article on Ethiopia, depicting everything very honestly. Um, so I think that's one of the things we can also take away from this is what can we do to combat this? And it's actually go out and support those that are telling the truth. So I actually uh, decided to contribute. I donated a little bit to Counterpunch. And then once I read that article and they wrote such an honest account on Ethiopia, I was like, okay, well, I have to really give him more because it was just, it was therapeutic for me just to see the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I give people credit for that. And we, I guess we now have to pay for the truth because otherwise we'll be assaulted by this. So now I'm gonna mention, I'm gonna introduce John Philpo, um, who um, is a Canadian criminal defense attorney and expert in international criminal law. He has 35 years of experience as a lawyer, activist, and speaker in the international peace movement in Canada, Latin America, Africa, and Middle East, and Asia. He's a member of the Coordinating Committee of the Coalition BDS Quebec. He recently joined the Board of Just Peace Advocates, and John is also president of the Rwandan Political Prisoner Support Network. He's a former judge at Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal in 2019, and he was an observer of the International Trial Watch Catalan referendum case in Madrid. He's advised governments and NGOs on international criminal law and acted as a judge at the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal. Please welcome John Philpo. So I'm, I'm not muted, eh? Very good. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is I'm speaking today on behalf of Sanctions Kill, which is an umbrella organization in the US and Canada who is dedicated to fighting sanctions. And I have a copy of our sanctions report, which I'll refer to you in a minute or two. I am um, very pleased to be with you and with the Ethiopian people after this uh, big struggle you've been in and this overwhelming victory for democracy and uh, the percentage of 
for your government was extremely high. I'm wondering whether you've been invited to the U.S. for the big meeting on the 9th and 10th. I know the answer. Now, um, I'm, we're going to talk about sanctions a bit today, and the U.S. An, uh, announced on May 23rd some sanctions on individuals and additional sanctions on September 27th. And my reading of it, as I'm not an expert on Ethiopian economy, is that the November 1st announcement about the um, Ethiopia's audit compliance with AGOA could have tremendous consequences. And our previous speaker, Mr. Irvin, uh, described uh, with a lot of knowledge about the importance of AGOA to uh, your economy and the terrible suffering that people would uh, undergo. And uh, it's going to be African people and African women who are going to suffer, I think, a lot in this. Um, we, we have to be realistic about the U.S. attitude. They do not care about human rights. They do not want to do anything about crimes committed by the insurgents. They do not want to do anything about UN-sponsored, uh, the theft of UN-sponsored relief supply, supplies taken by the Tigray army. My observation is that the UN, which is controlled a lot by the SD infrastructure, has been helping the Tigray insurgents. And let me remember, remind you that Samantha Power and Susan Rice have been around for a long time, and we know a lot about them and the way they act when they travel in Africa and they work in Africa. Our experiences, myself as an observer, and my work in international courts is the U.S. wishes to break up viable countries which um, they cannot control. And we will recall the last 30 years, Yugoslavia, the Congo, and I think Nigeria now with the, with the, uh, uh, in the north of Nigeria and other related areas. Sanctions are a form of war. It's not human rights. Our organization is called Sanctions Kill. We don't like to talk about killing, but we must. It serves to weaken countries. It's a form of siege war, which has been existed for a long time. In recent, relatively recent years, Cuba has been under a blockade for 50, 60 years. I wrote 50, 60. Zimbabwe has been under blockade uh, since 2000. And it, it nationalized the land and refused the U.S. model. The SADC has the 25th of October uh, anti-Zimbabwe Sanctions Day. Returning to Ethiopia, there are different tactics, and I think your country has faced them all. A proxy military war, and they arm and you know more about the exact arming than I do. Media lies, Anne has uh, underlined it, and I, I can only, the infiltration of the media and every strategic point in the US, Canada, in Europe, reminds me of the Rwandan Patriotic Front and the way they function between 90 and 94. And the final tactic they are trying to use, and they, I think we have to stop it now. Don't let, don't let, uh, okay, can you, I knocked my, I knocked my um, mic off. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, um, sanctions are, 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 we have to stop them now. And we wrote a report to the Biden government, um, which is called, We Don't Deserve This about sanctions, and um, they, it is available. You have it, and it can be, you can have it on, the, on your uh, internet uh, from us. It's also on the Sanctions Kill website. And we talk about Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, Zimbabwe, Nicaragua, Syria, and in Lebanon is suffering also, North Korea. They wreak death and destruction 
We do not want that to happen to your country. Our report in legal terms underlines the fact that these sanctions are violate the charter of the United Nations, the sovereign equality of nations. And a country like the US or, or Europe cannot intervene in your internal affairs to try and impose a change of government, a change in policy. That is illegal. And last December, um, the US General Assembly voted in Resolution 75181, rejecting uh, in, in a resolution on human rights and unilateral coercive measures, they voted by 70% against them. So the world is against sanctions. It's stronger and stronger. The world is talking about unilateral coercive measures. I was in Niger in October at a conference. This is a common uh, theme and we are all aware of it. It's a crime, it can be a crime against humanity when there is extensive suffering. Now, you are uh, aware of the geopolitical issues, um, your desire for electricity and the lack of will, political will to negotiate with Egypt about the Nile, which is certainly can be resolved. That's my understanding. Um, the US and does not want Africa to be strong and sovereign and to negotiate with Russia, with China, with the US, with Europe. They do not want that. Um, I want to refer very briefly to this question of negotiations. I, one of the previous speakers. Negotiations are a tactic used by the party which is scared. So don't, I, I, my, 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 my power, strong belief is that there should be no negotiations and that victory is the only solution uh, and the only reasonable aim. People on the battlefield can decide, I can't decide, but that's my instinct about this. Um, we are, as sanctions kill, is supporting your struggle. And we are having a webinar on the 23rd, 23rd of January about resistance to sanctions. Countries have very interesting ways of going around sanctions. And that's maybe what your country will have to face. Um, not industrialization, dealing with other countries and not depending only on the West, um, distributing food, Governments have a lot of power to uh, try and get by sanctions. Zimbabwe has worked very hard on it. Um, I just want to also refer to the media. I have, um, I, what you said about the media and about Anne Garrison and others, Rania Kalik, Eugene Poirier, The Gray Zone, Mint Press News, these are the ways in which these issues can be, be discussed. The world is turning in your favor. You are stronger than Rwanda was in 1994. You have allies. We are entering into a multipolar world and law must be applied to your country. International law, sovereign equality of nations. Sanctions are illegal. They're contrary to all the entire international legal system. And when they talk about a rules-based order, which we hear from Germany and from the US, the rule-based order is the United Nations order. And this must be, this is one of the ways to defend your country. There are many other ways, of course. And uh, so thank you very much. And I would like to thank you very much for a lot of things I've learned in the last week or so, and well, actually for the last year, but particularly in meeting some of you recently, and including Benyam last week. Uh, it's a wonderful experience to work with you. Thank you so much. All right, um, well, thank you so much, John, for bringing your legal expertise and your advocacy to this very urgent um, topic and discussion today. Um, I want to say to everyone who is watching this, um, either on Zoom or Facebook or on YouTube, 
uh, I really want to encourage you to read the sanctions kill report that John uh, has mentioned. Knowledge and consciousness is a very, very important tool for Africans, especially. Know your history, know policy, be armed with the data. All right. So uh, next, I have the pleasure of introducing someone from the Eritrean community with a great amount of experience and an analysis that will help us to better understand how sanctions function. So Dr. Barhe Haptogorgis has had a fascinating life journey leading up to this moment. He was born and raised in Eritrea. Later, he found himself in Ethiopia. He graduated from Harar Military Academy and served as officer in the Imperial Bodyguard. Dr. Barha then graduated from Addis Ababa University and American universities upon his arrival to the United States. He has worked as a management expert and corporation manager in Ethiopia for the Secretary General of Ethiopian Chamber of Commerce. In addition, he has been professor at American universities for a sum total of 33 years, and he is now a professor emeritus. With that said, I would now like to welcome Dr. Barha. I just got a message, he's out. He's on my phone, he said he's out. Oh no. Okay, well, let's see if we can do uh, some troubleshooting. Yeah, he was just in a few minutes ago. Um, I'm not sure. So Dina, if you, um, if you wanna work that on the background. Um, yeah, I think, let, should we go ahead and uh, go ahead with Binyam um, and then Dr. Badha can join us after, is that all right? Surely, go ahead. And okay, in, great. In the meantime, I'd like to mention that, please do not forget to support Ann Garrison. And I think we put the link on the chat for you. Go ahead, Dina, thank you. Yes, thank you, Asqual. So um, in the meantime, I want to discuss uh, Biniam Gatao, who is a fellow Ethiopian organizer. He has been working really hard um, to shed light on the political and social chaos that the TPLF uh, set in motion especially within the last year. So to describe uh, Binyam's background a little bit, Binyam Tetao's educational background is in political science, philosophy, and religious studies. He also has training in law and psychology. Following in his father's footsteps, who is the late engineer and NASA scientist, Dr. Ketao Ejugu, um, Binyam is an advocate who exposed TPLF in the early days. Binyam describes himself as a human rights activist and community organizer, and he is uh, coming to us from Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Binyam. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being involved. Um, first off, I think it's important to say that the legacy of Ethiopia and being Ethiopian is beautiful. It really is, yes. Uh, we represent the source, the origin of humanity. We were literate and wrote poetry and wrote philosophy, practiced science, and practiced the Abrahamic face of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, when much of the world couldn't even read. Before there were knights of the round table in England, Ethiopians were the knights of Africa. I'm very proud to be an Ethiopian American. I believe that Ethiopia deserves to remain free and uncolonized, to be free in governance, to be free in choice economic. Uh, decisions and to be free as a free thinking person. Um, I think it's important to uh, uh, say something uh, uh, separately uh, that uh, the legal mechanisms that were imposed on Ethiopia regarding the current Mullah Zanawi constitution, the way Ethiopia was cut up into ethnic regions, uh, even the flag having uh, uh, that uh, TPLF star on it, which is not what the Ethiopian people deserve needs to be handled immediately. And I think that these conversations regarding sanctions and uh, immediate uh, new constitution, proper regional borders, proper flag, proper human uh, rights, proper uh, um, uh, uh, value of human life need to be addressed simultaneously. So saying that, um, I think that that should be the next part of our discussion in the future, maybe towards the Q&A session. But I, I invite all Ethiopians that to make this a priority, we need a, a constitution, we need our proper flag, we need to remove ethnic federalism, we need to remove ethnic borders. 
Just a few days ago, uh, Representative Brad Sherman of California gave an extremely misleading statement on CNN. The host said that the aid workers are literally under fire without telling the truth, naming that it was the TPLF to grain rebels that have killed international aid workers, and also that the TPLF to grain rebels were the ones that stolen uh, the, the aid from the UN and World Food Program, and that they used that in order to fuel their efforts to continue the war. Uh, she did not tell the truth that these, these uh, aid organizations have been actively aiding the TPLF to grain rebels with equipment and logistics. She further stated that it's the Ethiopian government who's hell-bent on waging war without actually naming the aggressors, which is TPLF. Uh, she further stated uh, that it's, oh, she misstated, and this is very key. That's important to note for nearly six months, it was the North Central regions of um, what is now called Amhara region and the Eastern region, what is now called Afar region, that were primarily defending themselves without the involvement of the national Ethiopian National Army. This is important because when accusing the Ethiopian government, she's not talking about how the Ethiopian government withdraw the military positions uh, by based on the Western pressure, primarily the United States and UN, causing the civilians to have to defend themselves. So in some cases, farmers were actually selling their livestock in order to buy weapons. Brad Sherman praised the TPLF to grand rebels, treated them like some kind of heroes, called what's happening in Tigray all the making of, the, of a genocide without telling the truth that these TPLF to grand rebel, rebels with the, help, with the help of hired mercenaries, some of them of which were Arab, are attacking and invading various portions of Northern, Central, and Eastern Ethiopia. I'm gonna give you some numbers that are very critical. In Amhara region, in the Amhara regional state, it's estimated it's between 25 and 30 million people. Out of that 25 to 30 million people, 2.5 million have been internally displaced. That's 10% of the population have been internally displaced, meaning that they've been ripped out of their homes, lost their properties, uh, uh, have nowhere to go, and have no means to support themselves as a result of this TPLF invasion. Also, consequently, in our far region, uh, off our regional state, roughly 400,000 people have been, been internally displaced. That's 20% of the region's population. Now imagine a state here in the United States, California, saying Northern California had 20% of its population internally displaced and Southern California had 10% internally displaced. That would be definitely a crisis. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you some images to, to make you kind of see visibly the kind of the devastation and some of the inf misinformation that's been happening. Just give me just a second so I can bring those up. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Everybody should be able to see uh, my screen now. We're going to go one by one per slide. I've used various um, various sources to find this information. Hello, Bruno. Yes. Can Hello, you see Bruno. my screen? Oh, Dr. Barha, yeah. If you could please mute. Binyam's going to finish up, and then we'll have you go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So, Hello. for example, uh, these are atrocities by TPLF. One example, and you have to remember, a war is fluid, so uh, things happen in different parts of the country. So as you see, TPLF forces have shelled hundreds of towns, uh, particularly targeting civilian targets, not military targets. Uh, here in northern Uganda and Wolo, these are kind of north and north central Ethiopia, at least 4,731 civilians were massacred. Okay, uh, That's just one part of Ethiopia. That number is much higher now and definitely doesn't include the other parts. Uh, this is also very important that the uh, major uh, media outlets are not um, reporting almost anything about the TPLF to grain rebels are actually stealing children from the Amhara and Afar regions and then using them as human shields uh, in their offensive. So as we all know, child soldiers is a use of child soldiers is a war crime. Uh, here is another figure about the 2.5 million Amaras 
have been internally displaced from Wollo and Gondor province. That doesn't include Shoa, the other central region. That's why the number is at about 2.5 million. Of those, over 18,000 children under age of five in the Amara region alone are expected to severe, be severely malnourished in 2021. Um, for example, in just one, uh, two battles, one in uh, Kambolcha and one in Desi, these are in central, central, north central Ethiopia, province called Wollo, 280 civilians were killed. In Desi, 250 civilians were killed. And this is just uh, uh, um, a, a few months ago. Just recently, these two uh, cities were liberated. Uh, what's important that the TPLF rebels target civilian um, civilian facilities, civilian homes, civilians in order to create mayhem and chaos. Um, multiple sources highlighting um, where you can find this information. Uh, I'll come back to this slide because this is important. On Twitter, you can find different types of information. This one I particularly like, it talks about a Chenna, Chennai massacre. In one day, as, uh, as um, uh, Amhara regional forces were retreating. The Tigrayan rebels uh, attacked civilians as revenge uh, for the Amhara um, uh, 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 soldiers standing up to the TPLF rebels. Um, on December 5th, it was reported Tigray rebels have massacred 70 Amhara civilians in a town called Anso, Anso Kanyana, and another one in Gamsa North Shore. Another massacre on December 5th, four in Amharas in Gashena, Northern Wollo. Uh, here, it talks about the um, local witnesses about how OLF, it's another terrorist group that has joined forces with TPLF, massacred uh, three, 33 Afar women. So this is the Afar province in east, Eastern Ethiopia. The devastation is horrendous. Um, these were medical facilities. Um, uh, they were looted, bombed, destroyed. Um, this is in Wadlow province. We'll get shortly to uh, Afar province. This is in Afar province where it talks about, I'm sorry, this is in, in Shoa, which is central Ethiopia, which it shows that the TPLF Tigrayan rebels have further pushed out south into central Ethiopia. And yet, remember, Brad Sherman was praising them as heroes. This is in Afar province. Um, you can find this on Twitter. Uh, two, uh, um, uh, two Twitter accounts I like, one of them being Kafar Media, shows that uh, even religious sites, uh, Islamic mosques, are being attacked, looted, and bombed, and burned. Um, and this is another uh, showing of the atrocities and um, property destruction in central Ethiopia show. Now this is interesting uh, because as you've seen, a lot of the United States government officials, Brad Sherman most recently, uh, Samantha Powers, um, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield, um, Karen Bass have all been supportive of, of the Tigray genocide narrative. However, right here, Sean Jones of USAID Ethiopia says very clearly I do believe that TPLF has been very opportunistic. Maybe they've even stealing, stealing from citizens. He, he says, we don't have proof of this. Several of our warehouses have been looted and completely emptied, particularly in Amhara region. So this is a list of daily massacres. It's another tweet, a Twitter account that I think you, is good to follow. It gives updated information. And then again, in Afar region, you see uh, attacks on um, mosques. A masjid is another word for a mosque, which obviously is a religious, uh, religious house. Now, what's been happening is, is more and more we've been able to get access to uh, interviews. And this Desi resident, and Desi was just recently liberated from the TPLF uh, uh, to Grand Rebels. He said that the UN has been feeding them they use the UN vehicles to transport their soldiers, even to the extent of going into the UN offices. So this is very important. This says that there are entities like the UN, like the United States government that we can't trust. 
that are involved in the mayhem and chaos in Ethiopia. Um, this is more mayhem and destruction in central, uh, north central Ethiopia. This particular one is of university facilities um, located in south Waldo zone of Amhara region, Waldo University's president, Dr. Mangasha Ayane. And he shows parts of the uh, parts of the uh, destruction. Um, now it's interesting. Uh, a few articles are starting to come out. This was very disturbing. It says UN halts food aid in Ethiopia's Kambolcha and Desi after looting. Now again, like the CNN report that Brad Sherman was involved with, they talk about the looting and the destruction of someone, uh, and that's the reason why there needs to be intervention. But they never ever name the aggressors, except little 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 small snippets where they make it a bit vague. But this is as a result of the Tigray, the TPLF Tigrayan rebels looting the food aid, and then the the World Food Program leaving instead of to help the Amhara and Afar civilians, they leave after the the Tigray rebels retreat. So I wanted to go back to uh, one more image that was important. Um, right here. Now, this, um, this is a, a map we'll come back to in a second. So traditionally up until 1991, this was the Ethiopian map. You see Tigray is here. You see it doesn't touch the, the water. It's relatively small. Uh, Bagamder Gojam, Wolo Shoa, those are traditionally the Amhara lands. Um, if we go to the next um, map, we're showing the, the TPLF era uh, map of the provinces, which is quite different. Tigray has increased in size. Other regions are created um, erroneously, falsely, based on uh, ethnic uh, borders that never existed in the past. You see Tigray has grown south and also grown west uh, in bordering Sudan. That, that did not happen before. But what we're seeing now more in different places is a, a something called Abai Tigray. Great or greater is the English translation. The idea is, is that if, if um, the TPLF, TPLF rebels can't get back in political power of all Ethiopia, they want to create a, uh, a new country. What's very important about this is the borders are extended up into Eritrea, extended out to the Red Sea, ex extended out into Western Ethiopia to control the Blue Nile waters. So you have to understand that, there, that um, just like John Philpo said earlier, uh, I mean, negotiation with a group like this is uh, unacceptable. They don't want peace. They're not interested in a successful Horn of Africa. They just want domination. So um, I yield my time. I appreciate being involved. And I'd like to close with uh, just saying that um, I appreciate that I could be involved in this discussion. And I think the next steps of the discussion is uh, that uh, not only do we need to fight against state sanctions, is that we need to also talk about changing of the constitution and the legal mechanisms that allowed TPLF in, in order to gain power over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. and as well as um, uh, do the damage that they've done at this uh, time in history. Thank you. Thank you, Binyam. Um, so with that, I want to take us back uh, to, thank you for giving us that focus discussion about um, Ethiopia, the atrocities that are happening right now. I wanna take us back to our discussion on um, sanctions. And at this point, uh, after uh, having introduced Dr. Berhe earlier, I wanna invite Dr. Berhe to, to um, discuss what he calls sanctions as an act of war. Thank you, Dr. Berhe. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Can you see me? Uh, it's yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> I had such a difficult time, you know, trying, trying to connect. Anyway, I'm glad it's over now. Uh, I missed some of the uh, presentations, you know, ahead of me, so I might be uh, running the risk of repeating some points, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I'd like to go ahead right to the main uh, themes, you know, of my uh, presentation, and that is 
the main title of uh, today's uh, discussion was sanctions kill. And I want to add a couple of words or statements to that. And I want to say sanctions do kill for sure, but, but they could also be suicidal to the perpetrators. Whoever is using sanctions, it's like using a gun. That gun can be turned against the user also. So it depends on how people confront it. So far, it has been uh, mighty powers against midgets, you know, all over, who have no military, who have no st stable government. All they have was uh, or is resources and uh, probably some uh, interesting location that uh, other big powers in Europe and the Western world, you know, buy or want to have. And they fall victims. And one way of me, uh, exploiting the situation is to create dissent inside the countries. And so you use one group versus another. That's the main weapon. And they use three different approaches. One, uh, demonize, isolate, and then eliminate leaders. They do that. They invade countries. And uh, the other method is use sanctions. So sanction is a tool of war. It's a means of conducting war. It's war by other means. Reversing the close, you know, saying which uh, states that uh, war is an extension of politics. And I want to say sanctions are extensions of war. So it's war, actually. And what we have to understand is uh, there are certain geopolitical and international, you know, relations situations, mostly economic and political in nature. Uh, that big powers are trying to use in order to exploit or to uh, pursue their own interests. And what's happening now is the uh, United States and China are in such a situation where there is a change in the supremacy of uh, leadership of the world as a big power. China is emerging to be the number one fast, fast, you know, approaching. And usually, these kinds of situations don't happen without wars. Of course, nowadays we have thermonuclear situations and we cannot have thermonuclear wars. They will destroy each other. So what do they do? They play this game with the client nations, with the client states, especially resource-rich countries like African countries uh, and Europeans declining in their economic uh, prowess you know, very, very fast. So what do they do? They try to exploit African resources, so give them independence, but at the same time, they keep on exploiting their resources. So Africans are new colonies, nothing else. And what happens in, uh, what's happening in this world now is there is some change taking place now. It happened, it started happening in a small place on the western Red Sea coastline of uh, southern Red Sea coastline of Eritrea. And Eritrea became a defiant nation and challenged the world, the big nations of the world, the Soviet Union at one time, the United States and the Western allies, you know, at another time, and came out victorious through resilience, hard work, and sacrifice. And this has now started moving in. You know, new ideas usually start in very small places, and then they keep on growing and growing and growing, and then they engulf everybody. And that's what's taking place now. There's a change taking place in Africa. We started in Eritrea, it's uh, expanded to Ethiopia, spread to Ethiopia, and probably Somalia may be in the group, and other countries. No more, for example, the slogan is now being uh, upheld as uh, the standard slogan of African nations and African people, for that matter. And so what's going on now is very serious condition of uh, military confrontation. So war is actually taking place. But they use clan states. They use division within those countries, within those areas, those societies, and that's exactly what they are using. They are using the Tigray People's Liberation Front in the name of the, of the Tigray people, poor people, to be used in the war against the Ethiopian people, the Eritrean people, the African people in general. So what's taking place now is a confrontation between big powers, China and the United States, and probably the develop the uh, European former colonial countries 
uh, United States and uh, its Western allies versus China. China now is being uh, dubbed as the top country in the world, the most powerful country in the world. And so no wonder that it's been challenged, but it's also using uh, its uh, economic advantage, its uh, different approach in terms of uh, national development issues, governance and things like that, and it's taking over fast in Africa. It's not the companies that are simply taking products and uh, doing away with them, but it's the country, the Chinese government going into Africa, building roads, infrastructure and all that, and developing the continent. And this is going to create an alliance with the countries, emerging countries, with the uh, rich resource countries, but not fully industrialized. And so, uh, in fact, yesterday, uh, I read in the, in the news that uh, the Nicaraguan government in Central America has actually recognized the Rep People's Republic of China. Up to now, it was supporting Taiwan. And that's a big shift. And that's, that means, you know, they will be building a canal, they will be doing this and that. And the, the shift in power is going to take place even that far in the uh, doorsteps of the United States. So in Africa, where we have the Red Sea, where we have, you know, a huge continent rich in land and uh, agricultural resources and where resources are going, food resources are going to be extremely, extremely scarce and uh, important because of the increased population in the world, Africa is going to be very dominant and China is helping in doing that. And instead of uh, competing in this regard, you know, in a holy way, uh, in a, you know, good way, the United States and the other European countries are trying to use sanctions, destructive, introducing, you know, restrictions of food, uh, everything, everything that these countries need, everything that the African countries need. They are using a negative approach and it's going to work against them. Eventually, sanctions, not only that do, uh, they don't work, not that they are suicidal, but they also, they also help the enemy. They help the enemy. It's like giving your gun to the enemy and tell him, shoot me. It's not even suicidal at that stage. And so what's, what's happening is the United States, by following this foolish, foolish steps, uh, that they call sanctions, intimidating countries and governments and all that and peoples, they are relinquishing their position in the world. So it's not good for the for the uh, American people also. It's not good for the American government or country also. It's not good for anybody. Eventually, although there is some suffering involved, African countries are going to benefit from it. I would like to mention a little bit about the Eritrean experience and how Eritrea managed to confront the mighty nations that were supporting the uh, Ethiopian government during the War of Liberation. And later on, after independence, uh, confronted the TPLF-led government uh, for almost 20 years now, under one of the most severe kind of uh, sanctions. We couldn't even transfer money here for family support. Could you believe it? We had so much difficulty. Forget the government that was trying to buy armaments. No, they couldn't do that. Or oh, any kind of uh, imports, they couldn't do that. Why? Because somebody said, you know, this country is supporting this and that group and all lies, you know. Now we have seen how lies, you know, are also uh, a common way of life, you know, in this uh, uh, political world, especially in the West. They were used against Eritrea 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And so what did the Eritreans do? The Eritrean government solidified the people. This, the people also uh, stood behind their government, supported their government all the way. And they made so much sacrifice, uh, even if it meant, you know, uh, living under conditions that were full of deprivation, material deprivation and what have you. They knew that if they resist this you know, resilience, won them independence, and that now it also is going to help them keep their independence. And that's what they did. And that's what the Ethiopian people and other people who would like to fight sanctions have to learn. 
the people have to be united with the government. There may be so many things, you know, that may not be uh, attractive, you know, at that time, but that's not the time to fight them. Think about the war. When the United States was fighting a war for five, six years, you know, during the Second World War, did people think about anything? No, the war was the most dominant thing. And when the war came to an end, then people started, you know, taking, you know, various things in life seriously and getting married, having families and all that. But during the war time, the war was the most dominant thing in their life. And so this is what people in the African continent should know, and especially in Ethiopia should understand. When it comes to survival as a nation, they have to stand together. They have to suffer probably so many uh, uh, unpleasant things in life, uh, such as, you know, uh, not having adequate food, not having this, and material things, basically. But the moral satisfaction they get in terms of winning in the end is going to be paying off in the, in the end. And that's what I uh, recommend, you know, to my Ethiopian brothers and sisters. This time will pass. And you will feel so proud about it. And the nation that emerges after this ordeal is going to be very, very powerful. Ethiopia is on its way to becoming a great nation. It's a great nation, but it's on its way to becoming a far more greater nation. And in alliance with people like the Eritrean people, the Somalis and its neighbors, the region is going to dominate Africa in terms of positive leadership and example, setting an example. And Africa is going to lead the world. Europe is going to be a third world, you know, continent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Berge. Uh, just a wealth of experience. And I spoke to you a little bit last week and I was just engulfed and really, truly inspirational. And thank you for of being the panelists today. And we look forward to doing more projects with you in the near future. We now are moving to our Q&A section. Make sure everybody posts their questions on the chat. That's the only way we'll be able to accept your questions. Here to moderate that is Dina Asfa and Elias Amara. And before they moderate the Q&A, they're going to go ahead and say a few words. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dina Asfa, uh, who is also a co-host with me. She's completing her doctorate in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on medical practices and mutual aid pioneering in the Nakba trenches of Eritrea during Eritrea's liberation struggle, 1961 to 1991, and how those social practice continue to inform the contemporary framework of Eritrean sovereignty. She will briefly discuss how sanctions are understood and utilized for, uh, from an ac academic standpoint before she goes to her Q&A moderating. Alongside her is uh, Mr. Elias Amara. Uh, he's been very helpful getting this webinar together. Uh, Elias Amara is an Eritrean American independent journalist, researcher, and organizer and a longtime peace and justice activist living in San Francisco Bay Area. He also is a chief editor and producer at the Horn of Africa TV. You can find his work at Elias Amara on Twitter. He will briefly discuss the uh, transactions from 2009 to 2018, um, and they will both transition to our Q&A session, and I welcome them. I welcome them both. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Asquan. So uh, like Asquan said, I'm going to be giving some brief comments. Um, uh, I just wanna say uh, or reiterate, Asquan mentioned that I'm an anthropologist and what that means is that I study the social world. Uh, that encompasses a lot of things, but one of the things that I do as an anthropologist is um, study the ways that policies affect ordinary people in their everyday lives. Um, so there has been some academic research on sanctions, what they represent, and the specific ways that they harm people, um, the most vulnerable people um, of a society. So in the interest of time, I will talk 
specifically um, about one study. Um, a political scientist by the name of Joy Gordon wrote a book so perfectly named Invisible War, which is about sanctions on and in Iraq. She exposes sanctions as a form of global governance. What does that mean? Uh, global governance is essentially a way to control and punish different countries when they do not make political and economic decisions according to major world powers interests. In recent history, um, all the evidence, all the history shows that um, the country leading sanctions ne negotiations and doing the sanctioning has often been the United States. So um, reading Joy Gordon's case study about Iraq is really useful um, in how and allowing us to, to, to understand, well, um, what do sanctions um, being levied on Ethiopia, what, what is the reason for it? So I can identify uh, maybe two big reasons. The first reason uh, has to do with the grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the U.S.'s desire to manage Egypt-Ethiopia relations so that it can secure the U.S.'s influence um, over the flow of resources in the Northeast region of Africa. The second uh, major reason that I can identify is uh, the recent peace negoci negotiations between Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Um, Somalia is currently in the process of nation building after much internal conflict, um, which we know, many of us know who have been following the news these, these last couple of decades, and um, especially recently, they were TPLF provoked wars. So I want to emphasize, um, though, uh, in, uh, in my brief points today, that the importance of regional cooperation between Ethiopia and Eritrea is, is a major source of, um, you know, sort of manufactured crisis right now in, in the Horn. Um, Eritrea is a politically independent African country. It borders the Red Sea. It's a geostrategic location that connects to the Arab world and through the Bab el Mandeb Strait to the Indian Ocean. And Eritrea does not govern based on directives from the West, United States, or otherwise. Eritrea governs according to its own political economic vision, and that vision centers on self reliance, self reliance of the people and self-reliance when it comes to sustainable development for our future. This guiding principle of self-reliance is not something that the West wants to spread to other African countries. Some of you may be wondering, why is that? Well, that would mean that Africans would have political consciousness. We would know our histories of being colonized, of being exploited. And it's also not about history, but it's also about exploitation that's happening right now. Um, and so ultimately, the self-reliance means that Africans will remove, we would be removing ourselves from the shackles of foreign aid dependency. And this, in fact, is the very reason why Eritrea was recently slammed with unilateral, illegal economic sanctions by the U.S. government. With that being said, I want to um, pass the baton to my dear comrade, Bitsai Elias Amara, who's going to talk some more about the consequences of charting the path to self-reliance through a discussion of sanctions on Eritrea. Thank you, Dina. Uh, my good Visaiti. I'm very proud of you uh, participating in this uh, very important uh, panel discussion on fighting uh, the pernicious uh, effects of sanctions. Uh, sanctions kill. Uh, sanctions on Eritrea and Ethiopia are meant as uh, weapons of war. Economic warfare is being waged uh, on our two countries. And uh, I would like to <clears throat> bring forth the importance uh, of solidarity. Uh, we are in this together. Uh, back, you know, when sanctions were imposed on us the first time in 2009, 2011 at the UN Security Council, we didn't have much support uh, in the world globally. Uh, we were fighting a lone fight against, uh, you know, hegemons of this world. So any voice of solidarity during that time meant a great deal for us. It inspired us, it uplifted our spirits, uh, and 
Garrison will testify how Glenn Ford's uh, voice during those times meant a great deal for us. A few progressives here and there who stood up on the side of Eritrea who said these sanctions are unjust and must be lifted uh, meant a great deal for us uh, and helped us in our resistance. So I say to our Ethiopian brothers and sisters in this moment when when the sanctions are being prepared. Uh, the, you know, the, the the global hegemon is uh, up in the ante. Uh, we are with you. We will defend Ethiopia. We will protect Ethiopia. I'm not saying this uh, in a rhetorical way. I am merely echoing the words of our honorable president, Isaiah Saforki, who said that at a state dinner to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, saluting him on taking the courageous step of peace. And he said to him, point blank, do not worry. Whatever comes ahead, there will be challenges, there will be obstacles, but together we will, be, we will defeat it. We will overcome it. And so we are in this together, and we will uh, come what may resist and in the end prevail. That is one message of solidarity I want to emphasize to my Ethiopian brothers and sisters. Ethiopia is very important to us, to Eritreans, and to the Horn of Africa region. We want Ethiopia to be strong, the economic powerhouse of the Horn of Africa. And as Professor Berhav Tegergis said before me, Ethiopia has great potential also to become a great power, a great influencer in Africa. It is the seat of African Union. Uh, there's great hope, uh, there's great awakening of the pan-African spirit of resistance. The no more, uh, you know, campaign is, uh, is being echoed all over the continent and all over the world. And so uh, to our global uh, friends, uh, supporters uh, who are here with us today, I also salute them. I, uh, I commend them supporting Ethiopia in this time of its need. Um, also support the, the vision of the new Horn of Africa, the vision of peace. We are for peace. We are actually the anti-war uh, resistors. Uh, when, when Ethiopia is being forced to, to, take, to take up arms, uh, to mobilize against the, the terrorist TPLF, this war was not its choosing. This war was imposed on it by, by, by the ethno-fascist clique of TPLF uh, for reasons that are, that are puzzling to many Ethiopians. The TPLF was supported by, by, by the United States. Why? Uh, people still continue to ask why. why. Why is the TPLF being supported? For almost 30 years, it imposed its tyrannical rule of it, uh, over Ethiopia, its minority rule. And uh, the West, the US, and the European Union countries supported it to the hilt. It destabilized the region. It waged war in Somalia. It waged war against Eritrea. And when, when all this failed, when Eritrea resisted fiercely, sanctions were imposed on it in 2009. U.S. engineered sanctions at the U.N. Security Council based on bogus uh, charges that Eritrea supported al-Shabaab. Anybody who knows Eritrea and its history, supporting al-Shabaab or Islamic extremism, jihadists, uh, is anathema to Eritrea. <laughs> Eritrea had been the victim of uh, uh, you know, jihadi terrorists. Uh, first from the Sudan and uh, later also the Melas Zenawi regime of TPLF was army proxy uh, groups against Eritrea, jihadi proxy groups. Um, these uh, jihadists slaughtered uh, five Belgian tourists in 1997 in Eritrea. In 2006, a British uh, geologist was also killed by, by jihadi terrorist groups. In the Gashbarka region, he was working for the Bisha mine for Nefsun uh, Mining Company. This is all on record. So uh, the charge that uh, Susan Rice and company brought at the United Nations Security Council in 2009 that Eritrea supported Al-Shabaab was uh, trumped up, uh, fab fabricated charge. 
so in order to strengthen uh, that charge, they also manufactured a border conflict with Djibouti. And based on this, they imposed uh, sanctions on Eritrea in 2009 and also further in 2011. Fortunately, unfortunately for Eritrea, uh, African countries were also used uh, as proxies in, in bringing these bogus charges, uh, say Kenya, uh, the, the Ethiopian regime, uh, Somalia at that time, Djibouti, um, and the African Union Peace and Security Council. But every year, you know, it was becoming evident that the, the, the charge that Eritrea supported Al Shabaab was unfounded, it was completely false. Eventually, everybody said that, uh, you know, uh, this is untrue. Uh, the, the board, the manufactured border with, with Djibouti was being handled by uh, Qatari mediation. And so, eventually, in 2018, when peace was finally achieved after the removal of the minority TPLF regime from power at the coming to power Prime Minister Abi Ahmed Ali. After that peace uh, agreement was signed, then and only then was uh, were the sanctions lifted uh, in November 2018. So all along that proves that the charges that Eritrea supported Al-Shabaab, that Eritrea, you know, the border conflict with Djibouti were just spurious uh, false allegations, lies uh, to manufacture uh, economic warfare on Eritrea. During those eight years of sanctions, Eritrea suffered. Yes, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. We, we suffered. Uh, it was hardships. But what got us through was that we all realized the, the, the entire population mobilized and said, we are in this together. Uh, we will uh, ration fuel if we must. We will eat one meal a day instead of three meals a day if we must. We will not cut off uh, social spending on education, on uh, health programs. And, uh, you will be surprised to know that during those hardship years, Eritrea registered commendable uh, Millennium Development Goals. It was one of the few African countries that hit the targets of, uh, in terms of infant mortality reduction, in terms of uh, reduction of communicable diseases such as TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS, and, and so on and so forth, in terms of women's emancipation uh, programs. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals uh, that Eritrea achieved uh, were not propaganda. The UN itself admits this. One of the few countries to have achieved that. How did Eritrea do this during those difficult years of sanctions? Well, we tightened our belt. We, uh, you know, we dug deep uh, and through resilience, uh, self-reliance, uh, you know, ensured some, so, some degree of self -se food security, um, some degree of, uh, you know, other development programs in, ter in terms of infrastructure, uh, road building, highway building, in terms of dam building, and so on and so forth. So in a way, sanctions can also have uh, the silver uh, lining in the cloud, beneficial side effects that, that you may not imagine initially. Um, so this coming period also may be actually good for Ethiopia. Ethiopia can wean itself off the dependency on, on food aid. Kick USAID out of Ethiopia. <laughs> USAID is, as, uh, as Professor Francis Boyle, whom Anne Garrison interviewed, an international law expert, he called USAID as a front organization of the CIA. It doesn't, doesn't provide any development aid. So uh, Ethiopia can become self-reliant. Huge potentials can, can, can be galvanized. Ethiopia can provide food not only for itself, but for the entire Horn of Africa region. Properly, um, so uh, I say, do not be afraid. Uh, you know, they 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 will try to to scare uh, and and terrorize people, uh, but you must not be afraid. You must stand up and and say enough, no more. Uh, and once the TPLF is removed from. You know, 
uh, as a threat, as an existential threat to Ethiopia and to the entire region. And once it's toxic, the toxic legacy of the TPLF, uh, the, the, the divisive ethnic politics is, is removed from the, uh, the political equation in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has great potential to achieve. The sky is the limit. So uh, by way of ending, I, I salute all those who are resisting uh, in the diaspora, the Ethiopians, uh, contribute to your country. Uh, open bank accounts in Ethiopia, send uh, money to remittance to your visit the country as uh, the, the great uh, Ethiopian Christmas visit that is envisioned where a million Ethiopians from the, the diaspora will, will, will go back to Ethiopia to visit home and celebrate with their people and their families. These are steps that, that could be taken. And, uh, and I, again, I reiterate, we are in this together. We are with you. Uh, I speak for many Eritreans when I say we will protect and defend Ethiopia. Uh, this is not mere boasting. It is uh, words that have been shown in action in recent times. We will be there with you. Uh, we have been there in the past year in the fight against TPLF. We are not ashamed to say that. Uh, I'm sure Ethiopia can handle it now. The, the end is, is in sight. In a, in, a, in a few weeks' time, the TPLF will be removed one, once and for all. And finally, Tigray will be liberated from this ethno-fascist kleptocracy. Uh, and then uh, tighten the belt for whatever may come. Sanctions are economic warfare, so be, be prepared for it. And um, it, it will start to get easy uh, by, by the beginning of next year. Thank you. And uh, with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you, Butai Elias. So uh, before we go ahead and move on to um, taking up some of those, these really great questions that people have submitted, um, Asqual is actually going to introduce a special guest who, who is joining us. Thank you, Dina. Yes. Um, and I want to thank both of you for your comments. Uh, Dina Asfa and uh, Elias Amara, these were really touching words and we look forward to collectively uh, joining hands in the struggle fighting sanctions. Um, with that, uh, we have Dr. Sanai Sanai uh, from Ethiopia, the genocide prevention in Ethiopia. Dr. Sanai is a biosecurity researcher. She specializes in both slow and rapid onset natural and man-made disaster risk modeling and prediction. She has in the past worked with the UN agency <clears throat> and has consistently volunteered for human rights causes. She's a co-founder and director of Genocide Prevention in Ethiopia, GPE initiative that is recently established to raise awareness regarding the alarming rampant ethnic-based atrocities in Ethiopia. And she's actively engaged in that and we welcome her. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Dr. Sanait, are you there? Yes, um, thank you very much, Asqual, and the entire team for um, organizing this excellent um, event. Um, just to really quickly uh, give a, a brief background, uh, very, very in one sentence uh, regarding GPE. Um, obviously, uh, um, Benyam has given a really good background on what the ethnic system is like. Uh, we first and foremost focus on local solutions, uh, but um, also, uh, you know, providing ally countries the understanding of the very disturbingly ethnically charged political system that is put in place in Ethiopia back in 1991 when the TPLF and OLF led coalition took power in Ethiopia. Uh, now, uh, we truly believe that prioritizing and uh, getting out of the war situation is important, but at the same time, uh, just like the other previous speakers uh, discussed, it is important to have local solutions and work through injustices and uh, really, like Dick and Yosef said, um, saying never again and internally for, of, um, you know, uh, solving uh, problems would actually uh, close, uh, you know, um, a nation from external pressures. So basically, GPE believes as much as it is important to say no more to the foreign interference, it is equally important to say never again to systemic injustices. 
Uh, with that, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for holding this excellent event that really highlights the depth and the complexity of the challenges Ethiopia is facing and how external pressure is making it difficult to work through them. I also would like to thank all the speakers for um, their insightful presentations. Well, most of you have already discussed the ill sides of sanction. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about um, what I believe is a very important topic. Um, as you have all perfectly highlighted one way or the other, when excellent force, uh, external forces use um, tools like sanction to pressure any nation into uh, any particular corner, rather than achieving the desired outcome, it's usually the citizens of that nation that suffer the most. And um, frankly, those who impose sanctions end up um, working against their own interests. And often the sanctions affect the very public it's meant to protect. Um, well, if that was the intention. So this pushes the public to have a very negative outlook towards the supposed allies. It also creates a people-to-people -people rift, uh, despite the truth that generally the public never has um, any ill intention to any other nation's public. I mean, such sentiments are usually cultivated for political means. And we've seen this during the Cold War era and other, other um, you know, wars in past, uh, cross-border conflicts and internal conflicts as well. So, but the angle I'd like to discuss today is a bit different. We all know democracy can only be maintained by a constant engagement and follow-up of the citizenry. Let alone countries that are, um, you know, just coming to grips with handling dictatorship, even countries in the West that have has been practicing acceptable level of, level of people's rule have been co-opted by corrupt corporate entities. So this usually happens either due to apathy or in cases of countries that have to struggle with external pressure, like heavy sanctions, uh, people prioritize their sovereignty and um, you know, survival over the type of rule they follow. So therefore, sanctions can actually be a tool that allows states to consolidate power. This has been shown time and again. I'll give a very quick example of an issue that is close to our hearts at the GPE. We believe Ethiopia will have to engage in a peaceful process of changing the ethnic political system. It follows. So the system pits one group with the other. The system sanctions ID cards that label ethnic identities. This should be a no-no like in, in, in the 21st century. Um, we should not be blind to the fact we cannot depend on goodwill of individual leaders because individuals get replaced. And as long as the rule in place allows, gross human rights violations with impunity, the vicious circle continues. The political engagement and democratic processes that need to take place to improve our political system can be greatly affected when external pressure and sanctions are involved. Again, we've seen this time and again. We've seen almost instantly how dissent gets discouraged and how people will be pushed to the state when external pressure is applied. It's always security versus liberty. Basically, wherever sanctions are involved, healthy political processes are naturally and easily suppressed in the name of national interest. Therefore, almost with certainty, we can say that those who wish to bring about democracy or whatever change through pressure like sanctions will end up extinguishing whatever democratic process that is taking hold locally. This actually gives excuses for state to become more repressive Finally, we, we hope this collective, as well as the public at large, can get it across to policymakers that sanctions are an absolute counterproductive tool to use in any political situation. And the, my final remark is, especially in Ethiopia, when systems, I would call it a genocidal system such as this is in place, and can only be um, moderated or amended in a, in a peaceful political process, Applying sanctions basically is taking away our chance of getting out of the system and getting into a more um, citizen-based, uh, you know, a better uh, process. So it, it, it literally actually kills and perpetrates the system to go on. I uh, thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful, Dr. Sanaid. I really appreciate you coming in and um, addressing uh, the audience. Um, more projects in the future, hopefully with you. Thank you so much. I'll send it back to Ina and Elias. Yes, um, thank you. That, it's such a pleasure to go after you, Dr. Sun Knight. That was extremely informative and you, you just had such an excellent um, synthesis on um, 
you know, how sanctions ties into what steps we need to take to move um, to move forward from the political catastrophe in the wake of, of TPLF's um, removal. So um, with that, I want to give a chance for some of these questions to be answered. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to handpick the questions that maybe will um, give us the most in insights on everything. Um, so my first question is for Dr. Berhe. Uh, Dr. Berhe, someone has asked in the Q&A section, um, the first speaker mentioned something about the uh, Biden using the Global Magnitsky Act on TPLF leaders. How is this? How realistic is this expectation? And furthermore, can the U.S. be expected to bring a solution to this TPLF instigated crisis in Ethiopia? Doctor Baha, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, I was not in at the time, you know, the first speaker was delivering his address. So uh, could you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, and maybe uh, Diak on Yosef can, can jump in perhaps as well. But um, yeah, so someone was saying, uh, someone asked about um, Biden's use of the Global Magnitsky Act on TPLF leaders. Um, how realistic is um, the expectation of the U.S. bringing a solution to this TPLF instigated crisis in Ethiopia? In my opinion, very unrealistic because the creator of the present day TPLF in terms of, you know, the uh, line they follow and uh, the ideology that they have, the program they follow in short, violent uh, suppression of uh, an occupation of uh, people in neighboring countries, suppression of Ethiopian people and occupation of Eritrea. That was the agenda. Somebody mentioned it uh, in one of the presentations uh, about the greater Tigray you know, issue. That was the main reason why we have all these problems in that part of the world now. The greater Tigray agenda was uh, occupation of Eritrea. Tigray will annex Eritrea, declare a greater Repu Re Re Tigray Republic, and then disband Ethiopia dismantle it completely. And that was the reason why we had this present day problems persisting up to now. And that's what the kind of agenda they have even now. So the United States is behind this move, behind this blind kind of uh, uh, political blunder that the TPLF is following. And I cannot expect them to find a solution, absolutely. The, the best solution that the United States can provide now is to keep its hands off. But unfortunately, a great government misled by uh, people on the side now. Some of them are inside the government cabinet members and so on, you know. But others, former cabinet members in the Obama administration, are the ones who are twisting things. And I feel, I believe that American ex-officials and some even in power may be corrupt. There may be a mafia kind of an influence, you know, in the United States. So the first thing the United States should do in the near future is examine its own acts, its own leadership. And Biden has the responsibility to do that. I have a complete belief that he's, you know, an honest man, an upright man, but he's surrounded by people who are no good in terms of foreign policy and the intelligence apparatus pertaining to our region of the world. In other parts, I don't know, but in that regard, all people that are involved and advocating one thing or the other, including the mass, the, um, the news you know, agencies and what have you, they are all corrupt. Somebody was mentioning, I think had mentioned the uh, money issue, money blend, you know, uh, squandered, I mean, stolen by the TPLF, billions of dollars. And some of this money, I think, is being used to finance, you know, the... TPLF operations. Thank you. If, if Thank I could you. piggyback off of that, if that's okay, Dina, I appreciate. Um, I think it's very, very important for us um, uh, in the diaspora, whether Ethiopian or Eritrean, to make sure to push our leaders uh, in Ethiopian Eritrea. Uh, that means uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and uh, President Isaias Afwerki. Uh, that it, it has to be, there's no negotiation with TPLF because the ideology itself 
uh, is a means to decimate the Horn of Africa or, or have full control, one or the other. There's no in-between. And this is important because there's lots of narratives. Brad Sherman said it in his um, uh, in his uh, his talk the other day in CNN that there needs to be some kind of negotiated settlement. But that negotiated settlement is the best interest of the West. What will happen is an old Roman tactic. I've talked about this in a few of my other uh, speeches in the past, where they're going to try to use the Western powers will try to use Tigray as a launching pad or as a springboard to continue the neo-colonialism that had been uh, uh, that the West had been benefiting the last 30 years. And so tied into this conflict is the loss of that benefit to the United States government, uh, to the British government. And we as uh, Africans, whether in Africa or without Africa, have to understand that leaving that opening just means continuous conflict going forward. And that's very dangerous. So it, it's important to be part of the discussion that we push the various uh, governments that we have influence over in order to, to essentially say never again, as Dr. Sinai had said, and not allow any influence for, from whether it's TPLF or anybody that builds ideologies around the TPLF agenda and have a chokehold or a springboard, as I like to put it, uh, uh, in order to re-colonize uh, or reconquer the, the Horn of Africa. Secondly, with regard to the U.S. government officials that uh, uh, Dr. Berhe Haptigorg has talked about. Frankly, I have personally, I have no confidence in them. I've been involved in multiple, I can't even count now, uh, where I've been involved as a, as a speaker, in fact, in some of these meetings with U.S. government officials. And they're actually extremely knowledgeable uh, on, on the issues, uh, on what's happening, on TPLF. And in some cases, we found that in our investigations that they actually have TPLF operatives or cadres, as we call them in the Ethiopian culture, working in their offices. So the idea is, is they understand. Karen Bass understands. Linda Thomas Greenfield, she understands. Uh, 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 Samantha Powers definitely understands. These are all Susan Rice graduates. Uh, they understand what they're trying to impose on the Horn of Africa, and and they they play a, a nice face, a, a, a subtle game of okay, we'll meet with you, and then as you saw with um, uh, Ilhan Omar and. Um, Brad Sherman just a few days back, I, mean, I think it's less than a week, they're essentially talking about bombing Ethiopia, putting boots on the ground, choking Eritrea's uh, 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 um, uh, naval, uh, naval apparatus. It's insane. We have to, one, say no more to the U.S. involvement from a government perspective. For example, I'm in Los Angeles, so we've already been dealing with Brad Sherman. We just had a uh, a protest on Wednesday. We're going to continue pressuring him. But we also have to say never again to the, the legal apparatus how the Horn of Africa was colonized in a sense. Uh, Neo-colonialism was put in place based on essentially the Mullah Sanawi constitution of 1994-1995. So I just wanted to- yeah, Binyam, kind of I, Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for giving us those insights. I actually want to, I think that's a really great segue um, for a question that I have for Diakon Yosef. Um, someone asked this question. I think it's really great because it's very simple. Um, and so I think that it'll it'll give people much needed clarity. But there's a question by someone um, called Ruth Strauss. And um, Ruth's question is, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? And I think you have some, um, you know, that, that, that might not be a, a, a straight answer. But with your experience, uh, your political experience, Diakon, I think that um, you can give, uh, you know, some some clear maybe definitions or some clear frameworks about how to think about different actors in, in this whole big event. Okay, so really, uh, from a very high elevation, um, you know, if one goes up to 30,000 feet and look down, what is it the West really wants from Africa? What it wants is countries that are ethnically divided and create a political fault line that in turn becomes their way of being able to control these countries. And one thing that we need to be clear about, why is it Ethiopia and Eritrea is so significant? It is so significant because as, as you, um, you know, indicated earlier, that you have 40% uh, of the world goods are gonna pass through them. If we were tucked in somewhere in the middle of Africa, even having a leader like Dr. Abe or uh, President Isaias, there are 
really truly are national uh, centric uh, leaders, um, they wouldn't like it, but they would not make our lives as 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 bad as it is now. So when you've got a very unifying and an independent leaders in conjunction with a geopolitically important area of the world of Africa, of Africa, then these are a very explosive elements that, that they cannot uh, follow. So in the case of Ethiopia, this was planned early on. First, Ethiopia should be landlocked. The West decided this long, long time ago, but make sure that it is in fact under the control of the ethnic uh, divisive uh, re uh, regime as like TPLF. And to their surprise, when they turned their face to Eritrea, they found President Isaias was a very nationalist leader. And he, you know, he, he especially in having um, the significance of the Red Sea, they knew that they could not tolerate um, his independence. So when TPLF collapsed, and in its place, you have a new nationalist leader, Doc, Dr. Abi, that came to power. And the fact that the, the, the two countries came to realize uh, their strategic uh, interest for peace, prosperity, and security, and that then, in fact, together, they can lead the other states of the Horn of Africa to come to some level of um, the confederation, so to speak, uh, an alarm went off. An alarm went off. So to answer the question, that fault line that I described earlier has produced close to about 80 ethnic political parties. But among them, is the, the vanguard of this is TPLF. And then we have the Oromo Liberation Front um, and particularly the Shenne who have joined together with them. Those are the bad guys, in, in, in just in, a, in, in summary. The good guys are the ones that basically believe in the unity, stability, and the interest of the, the common members of the state and the Horn of Africa. And a, at this time, unfortunately, um, the West and particularly the United States to, um, almost align itself, um, its interest with, with, uh, with these forces. Now, I wanna say quickly one important thing. Um, TPLF was in fact, was, uh, uh, a, a force in the horn, uh, that was a stooge for the United States in particular. And there have been, uh, you know, fully documented historical facts in the fact that the Ethiopian army was used to fight al-Shabaab and on all of this and the pretext. But it was, it, it literally, they were the messenger boy for 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 the United States. Now, However, we look at this, and this is the pretext and in, in the under the pretext of fighting terrorism. Well, when Ethiopia finally had to deal in fighting its own terrorism, the so-called a country with a strategic alliance, which was Ethiopia, is now being stabbed in the back by the United States full support of TPLF, the terrorist organization. And you couldn't even make this up. I mean, you can't even write this up and to, 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 to make it believe, believable. And so I want us to understand in this that our sovereignty comes first. And, you know, in the case of Ethiopia, um, it's no surprise that we are, in fact, have never been colonized. And it, it is truly... 
um, something that, that they have taken grudge on us for this reason. So whenever you bring in an, a, a force like a TPLF into the mix, that absolutely does not really feel that sovereignty is, is that sacred for Ethiopia. Uh, the West embraces it. And so uh, I just wanted to say, and there's a lot to be said about all this, but I just want to say the bad guys are anyone in Africa that you find that have organized themselves under the ethnic fault line, make an ethnic-based political um, uh, vision, um, are in fact are the first susceptible people that would fall under the ones that basically will surrender um, the sovereignty of their nation um, to essentially be a, a go-to people for, uh, for the West. Those are the bad guys. So now faced with a sanction, um, we're told unless we empower those people back into the political field, that the United States is going to use sanction against uh, the countries that uh, uh, advance uh, the national sovereignty of the country. I don't know if I answered the question, but um, I, 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 I'm trying to sum up this by saying that ethnic politics is our demon. And at the end of the day, un unless we rooted ethnic politics out of Ethiopia, Ethiopia will never have peace. The flesh and existence of TPLF, that we can conquer it, but the soul of TPLF is ethnic politics. And that needs to be also defeated. And that's why I truly congratulate and hail President Asayas, because he absolutely unequivocally revoked any sense of ethnic politics. You can make ethnic politics even from a small country that has uh, you know, diverse tribal and, and affiliation. You, you, one can make, uh, you know, Somalia was a good example of that. But the fact that he absolutely uh, would not tolerate that, that should be a good advice to, to Ethiopia as well. So um, thank you. That, that's my, my answer for the question. Thank you, uh, dear Con Yosef. You hit the, the nail right on the head, so to speak. Uh, it resonates with me a great deal. I agree with you. Ethnic politics is the demon, not only of Ethiopia, not only of the Horn of Africa, but of the entire African continent. Imagine we have thousands and thousands of ethnic groups in, in Africa. And if you go along the TPLF ethnic politics lines, it would be chaos and disaster. So with that, I segue then to the next question from uh, Horn of Africa TV uh, live chat. Uh, I will direct this to Professor Lawrence Freeman because I think you have addressed it. I heard one of your interviews with uh, Geopolitics, something, a YouTube channel three, four months ago, uh, where you talked about the China-US rivalry. And I'll read the question. and. Uh, uh, and then add on a few uh, of mine. The question says is from a guy or a girl who goes by the name of Red Sea Youth. Could you please ask one of your panelists, isn't Biden administration aware by pursuing its interventionist policy in Ethiopia, they risk pushing Ethiopia to look towards its rival, China? So, which brings us to, to the geopolitics question. Um, uh, so, your view on geopolitics, if I understand, you're not uh, enamored with that, uh, with that term, geopolitics. Uh, what is it, if you can elaborate a little bit and then go to what you said in that interview where China and the United States can actually cooperate to bring about development in Africa instead of unnecessary rivalry. Uh, having said that, I salute you for going to Ethiopia, sir, showing solidarity, very, very important. We, we are very, uh, very proud of, of uh, that step that you took in, in this time of need. And I, I'll let you answer the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. i am be happy to uh, participate in this uh, discussion. It's been extremely informative. 
basically what the, what I've been looking at for many, many years and decades of studying this is in Western governments, you do not actually have a homogeneous or monolithic government with a clear purpose. You have various factions and you have changes that go on over the time, over the 230 years of my country. I've seen political leaders represent the interests of the United States and I've seen our political leaders uh, not represent the interests of, of America as it was founded. In the Western government, and it's not just the United States, although I'm most familiar with it, is you have a grouping that I've been, I would identify as a, a geopolitical oligarchy, of people who uh, have great financial political control and see their doctrine, which I call a disease of the mind. But their doctrine is that the world is like a game board, chess or checkers. It's fixed. It doesn't grow. It doesn't change. And the main purpose of this geopolitical faction is to be on top, to be in control, and to use whatever powers and manipulations and capabilities, financial and political, to maintain that control. And that's been their view of Africa. Uh, this geopolitical faction does not care about the development of Africa. They, in fact, oppose the development of Africa. They're not interested in raising the standard of living. They're not interested in eliminating poverty and hunger, which I know can be done. They're not interested in that. They're interested in a game against the Africans and using the Africans against others for their domination. And it's correct, as Deacon Joseph said, much of it has to do with East Africa and the Horn, uh, the, the Gulf of Eden, the Straits, in that area where a great deal of shipping goes through up to the Suez Canal. Uh, this is, of course, very important. And that's one of the reasons Djibouti has so many military bases. And that is a part of their, of their political thinking. And they also do not want to see independent leaders. And I agree uh, with uh, Deacon Joseph uh, uh, that ethnicity is a demon. I call it a cancer on society. I've opposed it since I first stepped off the plane in Lagos and saw what was going on in Nigeria in 1994 and has continues to go on. And as you study the history of Africa, you see that ethnicity destroys nations. And the British used it, created it, fostered it. Ethiopia did it to itself after the uh, 1991 overthrow of the dirge. And this will be a tool and uh, Deacon Joseph is right, until this is eliminated, uh, Ethiopia will never be a whole nation. Uh, we have to, as I said in my lecture uh, a couple of days ago in Addis, we have to uh, have a, a unified Ethiopia where citizenship of a sovereign nation is primary, not what ethnic group, what biological bloodline you have, what, what piece of territory you came from. We are all human beings because we're created in the image of the creator with the potential of created creativity. And that's what unites us and makes us human. The problem we have with the Biden administration, and this is my best assessment at the moment, is that the President Biden, a long, well, well-known political figure, I don't believe he wants to have a war. I don't believe he wants to see death and destruction in Ethiopia. I don't think he wants to see regime change. Uh, I don't think that's what his outlook is. I don't think that's what his stomach can take. However, that's not the determining factor because in the Biden administration, you have a group of people committed to this geopolitical doctrine and they've already been named. I mean, you have people like Samantha Power uh, who was the leading, single leading individual for the military overthrow of President Gaddafi, which destroyed the Sahel. And hundreds of thousands of people have suffered across the Sahel from Northeast Nigeria to Burkina Faso, and will continue to suffer probably for years to come. They know what they're doing. They want people in power who they can manipulate, and they want people in power who will carry out and continue their or at least correspond or work with their geopolitical doctrine. You have people, of course, Susan Rice has a low 
position in the Biden government because she couldn't really have a high profile one given her track record, but she nevertheless is in the government. And we know the others, Gail Smith, I believe at one point actually was aligned as a, uh, with the TPLF. And therefore President Abi doesn't play that game and uniting the Horn of Africa with Eritrea and Somalia. That's not part of the geopolitical game of uh, bringing 6,200 megawatts of power into sub-Saharan Africa. That's not part of geopolitical game. They want to be in control. They want to determine what's going to happen. And they want to pick the people and use them. And ethnicity, even after the uh, defeat of the TPLF, ethnicity has to be eliminated uh, in Ethiopia. I proposed uh, in my speeches in, in Addis that this crisis could be used as a, as, uh, have a positive feature in that it could unite Ethiopia stronger and unite Africa in a stronger sense of their commitment to economic development. Because all the people of Ethiopia have a common interest in working together for the future development of Ethiopia. So Biden, even though he, I don't believe this is what he really wants to do, Nevertheless, he could be pulled into it. Uh, I warned some people in the Ethiopia government early on not to, to look favorably upon the Democrats. The, the liberal Democrats believe that their, quote, democracy and their humanitarian worldview has to be imposed. I think that was discussed earlier. They believe they have the right to impose their form of governance, their ideology, their view on the rest of the world. Anthony Blinken, the uh, Secretary of State, I think is very dangerous. He's made comments way before, early on in the conflict, as has been pointed out, of ethnic, he claimed it was ethnic cleansing and genocide and rape as a weapon. None of that has been proven. The UN has not ch chosen to use those words in their report. He's, a very, he's going to pull, he's going to try to pull Biden with the support of others in a fairly uneducated and uninformed Congress as well as an uninformed uh, population, that, that we have to intervene. There's a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. I've been discussing when I was in Addis, and I think, I don't know if the government really understands this, to, just to be frank with you, but as military victories, uh, as the ground force improves for the government, that the geopolitical faction may increase their desire for for destabilization. I could envision, I'm not predicting, but I could envision that as uh, the EDF uh, forces push closer towards uh, Mechali, that some people start saying, like Samantha Power said in her tweet, I think a couple of days ago, there's a humanitarian crisis. People are dying. People are dying. We have to do it now. We have to go in now. And that's what you got in Libya. And they used a responsibility to protect a doctrine that says this political faction in the world has a right to militarily intervene when they deem that the governments are not protecting their people, i.e. when the government is committing genocide. I'm not predicting that will happen, but these are the ways we have to be thinking about this geopolitics. And, you know, the, this, the, obvious, the obvious point is that this doesn't have to happen. Right. And as I mentioned many times, the United States could change its policy, could work with China, and China and the United States together would, could say, we are going to help Africa by helping empower them with long-term credits for infrastructure development, in energy, roads, rail, water management, et cetera. This could all be done. So there's a common interest for all the great powers and the African nations to collaborate for the development of Africa, which is in the interest of all of humankind. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Um, I, I want to take a moment to uh, take us back to our other esteemed guest, um, Anne Garrison. Anne, you are a professional journalist and thus a professional deep researcher. And we are so grateful to you in the Eritrean community, in the Ethiopian community for being so committed to this, um, this process, um, which is very serious, uh, this process of research, this process of aggregating data and evidence to 
tell a coherent narrative about what is actually happening. So um, with that, I want to ask you, how has, just given your experience, you talked about, um, you mentioned Rwanda and sanctions um, and, and sort of fake sanctions and those kinds of things. So um, with this uh, claim of genocide, which you talked about as um, specifically being used to trigger a military response. I really like that connection that, that you drew out for us. Um, so I want to ask you, how has the media scape changed with relationship to how evidence is used to make asinine, unevidenced claims like genocide? <laughs> and how are your thoughts on how we as the masses can take control of this narrative when it comes to corporate owned Well, I said some of that in my remarks. I'm not sure whether the person who is asking that question uh, was here at the time, but I said I would encourage people to stop putting all of their energy into criticizing the mainstream media or the mainstream, the, the corporate and state media and in a corporate state like the United States, it's more or less the same thing. Uh, I was at a demonstration where people kept chanting CNN fake news. Um, I am repeating myself here, but I would like to encourage you to um, pay attention to the independent media. I gave some examples, uh, Black Agenda Report, where I'm a con contributing editor. Uh, it may seem odd, but I'm, <laughs> I'm the one white contributing editor because of the amount of time that I've been willing to commit to understanding Africa and most particularly what the US gets up to in Africa. Uh, Lawrence Freeman's blog is, is great. There's somebody who has joined us here, Brother Warren has uh, a blog talk radio show called Wake Up New Orleans, which I've noticed has a wide audience, um, well beyond New Orleans. Uh, the Gray Zone is probably the most important investigative outlet we have now. Uh, Mint Press News is also an important investigative outlet and journal of opinion. Uh, Consortium News. I produce radio for Pacifica Radio. And in fact, soon I have to go um, and voice the narration for a show that we're doing this week, um, our national, Pacifica's national show, COVID Race and Democracy. Uh, it's, I, I can't, I can't endorse Pacifica Radio uh, across the board. It's a very mixed bag. There are stations all over the country. Uh, the show I work on is heard in New York, Washington, D.C., Houston, and Los Angeles. And, you know, I'd say I agree with about a half the program. The same is true of another outlet I write for, the Black Star News. Uh, I don't agree with everything. Uh, they say it doesn't really have an editorial line. The same thing can be said of Counterpunch, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't adhere to this, the talking points of the State Department that are given to us through the corporate um, and state corporate news. Um, so, so I said some of the best I best advice I could give is to turn it off. Just turn it off and encourage other people to turn it off. I have noticed that educated people who tend to be the kind of people Lawrence was talking about, people who have liberal values within the United States, uh, they tend to read the New York Times and the Washington Post and consider that they are well-informed. If <laughs> See, Lawrence is nodding along with me if they read those two publications. And it's very hard, it's very difficult to challenge them. I mean, I have a lot of well-educated family who feel this way. Uh, I say, what are you reading? The New York Post and, the <laughs> and MSNBC, uh, which is like democratic uh, cable news. Uh, Rachel Meadows, my favorite. Rachel Meadow, but yeah, yeah. But like, I, I have, uh, as I said earlier, this is changing because young people in Binyam, I think, would probably confirm this, that uh, they prefer web-based media. So if you can, share news from the outlets that I'm talking about, and don't expend all of your energy throwing yourself at CNN, because they're a lost cause. 
Does yeah. that help? Yes, thank you. And thank you okay. so much again, Anne, for, for reiterating that. Um, I think for a lot of people, I mean, you described yourself, right, as a, as a socialist. And so I think this is a, 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 time, a turbulent time for people's personal sort of, uh, you know, journeys of, of like political consciousness. And so grappling with, um, you know, how to um, organize and where to get information and how to do analysis is, is so important. And um, you need people to sometimes point you in the, in the right direction. And so, like I said, we're grateful for your work and for um, making it, you know, s simplifying that process of just figuring out what do we need to do next? How can we arm ourselves with the right information? Um, oh, I, so I, just, I just thought of something mm -hmm. I didn't mention. Um, the search engines that we all mm -hmm. use to search the web are important. And I have been turning to DuckDuckGo not relying simply on the Google search engine. The results, at first they were questionable. This is nonprofit. It's a, it's a nonprofit organization, DuckDuckGo. And the results are different. If you start, if you go up and switch your search engine, even if you're using the Google Chrome browser, you can switch to DuckDuckGo as your search engine. And the results are, the results are different and they're getting better. And the outlets that I mentioned are more likely to turn up. Can you spell that, Anne? Is that is that D O T D O T G O? No, it's duck, as in oh duck duck. Oh, okay. Duck, D, D, D U C K. Yeah. D U C K. G O duck duck go. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the question uh, here, Dina, for uh, yeah. <clears throat> For Jan Filippo, it's from Susna Tefera. She says to the attorneys on the panel, do you see any cause of action that can be brought either before international or US courts to hold certain individuals, entities, especially in light of the increasing credible evidence that US government representatives are indirectly pursuing regime change is there also a possibility to sue corporate media for pumping false narratives and creating hysteria? This has a direct impact on the economy of the country and on the mental well-being of citizens. This is a, it's a great question. So what does international criminal law say about this? Can we uh, bring uh, certain U.S. government officials to the Hague, to the international ICC, for example, for waging economic warfare unjustly? Well, let, let, let me um, make a few comments because I'm a lawyer. I like defending. I like international law and what it, the freedom and justice that is established by our international legal system. I was very involved in the Rwanda uh, defending people accused of genocide in Rwanda and trying to fight. Like, we have a big problem with Paul Kagame, who goes around intimidating people in Canada, and people sued him in the US. And there's a lot of problems about immunity, state immunity. There's a lot of problems about political will. There's a lot of problems about cost of suing in a US court. Um, so it's it's a very, and I mean in the Canadian legal system, we there was a project to sue the Canadian government for discriminating unjustly against Rwandan refugees based on fake refugee stories, and it's so difficult. And um, I'm a Canadian uh, or Quebecois, and I think that your country is very litigious. You want to sue all the time. In Canada, it's a bit that way too. And sometimes I want to sue people who insult me. But I'm not a great advocate of going to the courts. There are times when it could be possible. And I think that there are times when the international world is changing and there's such a great change in multilateralism that there may be recourses. I, I really think that in Palestine, there will be some recourses possible. In, in, say in Canada, but now I want to go back to the ICC. The ICC 
is not to be trusted. The ICC, Karen Can, new prosecutor, who actually I know him, I could chat with him, you know, he said for Afghanistan, we're not going to criticize, go after the US, we're going to talk about the Taliban. The Taliban fought for 20 years and got rid of a colonizing power. You like them or not, apparently they've changed. That's what everyone says. I don't know. I can't, I'm not there. The US has 10 million, 10 million dollars of and billion dollars of, of, of Afghanistan money. So the ICC goes after generally people that are not, they're like your government. I mean, I could see, I could see them trying to make a complaint against Mr. Abbey. You know, I, I, I just don't trust them. And I know the prosecutors, I know how they work, I know what evidence they have. I was on the Kenya case. And the evidence was shoddy. Whether or not you agree with the policy of Kenyatta right now, that's another question. But he was a target of the U.S. embassy. His name is Rannenberger, the former diplomat. And I was on those cases, although my client was released quite early in the process. It was not good evidence. And I've been on cases in international courts, generally, and I mean, there's obvious, most of the time they charge first and then try and get the evidence, invent the evidence afterwards. That's very shocking because in Canada, well, there's something, most people who are charged with drinking, driving or beating or murder, there's usually something there. I'm not saying there's not racist, terrible racist uh, stringing up of people in the, in the US or even in Canada, but the international legal system for prosecution doesn't work. It's not intended to work. And if you ask people of you know Ramsey Clark, Ramsey worked with us in the ICTR, the London Tribunal, and he said these chases are just another form of war, just like we said about sanctions earlier. So um, we should be sanguine about it. We have to use law. All this, we really have to use law. And I'm in favor of using law to, to advance the case, for example, of your country. But the recourses are, are not, you're not going to get, Mr. Deacon, the Deacon said, I don't see his, his last name, uh, Deacon Yosef said, um, no eth ethnic politics. All right, let's stop ethnic politics. It comes from the people. That's where it really has to go. And if you know Glenn Ford, because Glenn Ford was one of the four, everything, power to the people. That's where it really comes from. By the way, his book of his writings is available at Black Agenda Report, and it's worth reading. I'm just starting. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Go ahead, Dina. Um, so yeah, so we have one final question. Thank you everyone for staying with us. Uh, the final question came in and th the question is, um, is there you know, a case study that, that shows, uh, or that you all can discuss that shows a successful strategy or maybe sets of strategies against U uh, US sanctions? So I think that question might be good for either John or for the, for the deacon, but um, if you all could just uh, give us your response and then we'll go ahead and, and wrap up for today. Thank you. The deacon or? Yeah, there's another question that came in with it, which is do, do change.org um, and so forth, these kind of platforms, do they really work and are they effective? Um, right. So go ahead. Uh, well, um, first, some, I, I don't know the answer for change.org. Some people think it's a good way to raise things. I don't think they have much power. They don't force anybody. They may be just a way of sounding off. I don't know. I'm not going to make a definitive statement. Um, I think it comes down to politics. With respect to fighting sanctions, Sanctions Kill is going to have a webinar on the 23rd of January at 1 p.m. But Sanctions Kill doesn't have all the answers, but by no means. I mean, we're just, it's, it's this big push on sanctions 
is relatively recent, although I'm not in any, any way saying that the sanctions on, on Zimbabwe or Cuba or North Korea, which have been strangled by them. A lot of it comes down to self-reliance. And I'm not an economist. I live in Canada. And um, so I know, for example, that Iran has started to industrialize and getting away from the mono uh, econ economy based on uh, petrol. I know that I was in Venezuela a month ago, three weeks ago, as an observer to the elections. And they have had a lot of problems because they were hooked on oil and they were making a good living on oil. And then when they got cut off and the U.S. cut them off, didn't give them any parts, Nash took away their, their operations in the U.S., it became a very big problem. And what they are doing is they have this CLAP program, uh, Comité Local Abastamentiento. It provides food, a basket of food. And someone can correct me. I think they give 5 million families receive that. Don't quote me on the number, please. Uh, so, um, as Mr. Amari pointed out, when you're under sanctions, you learn to solidarity and unity. So there's no absolute answer, you see. Like Zimbabwe, um, Alina Duhan, and you can find it on the UN, made a report about the terrible effect of sanctions. And Mr. Amwali, who some of you know, who lives in New York, has talked to, to me or to some, uh, some people about how they're trying to get around sanctions. Um, Syria, it's really bad. Money is, their money is worthless. The U.S. financed the, jihad, the, the jihadists. And then when they, Syria won, or is almost won, they haven't quite won yet. They're still, actually, they're still occupied in three places, by the U.S., by Turkey, and by Israel. But they're under sanctions, and it's very difficult, and it's overflown into Lebanon, as we see from the headlines, and I read about it a bit, but. So uh, I know that the multipolar world will be a way out. I know that you, trading other currencies and getting off the dollar and getting off SWIFT is another way. These are things which we as observers know. I'm a lawyer and I don't know that much really. You know, I, I know some things. I can see what the paradigms are. And the people, I, I mean, a really a touching thing. It, it, it really hits me hard, this one. Alex Saab was a brilliant and well-to-do businessman who went to, became Venezuelan in 2004 and helped uh, the economy of Venezuela to build houses for three and a half million people. And on June 12th, 2020, he was traveling to Iran to get medicine, oil, and food for Venezuela. He was one of the geniuses in helping Venezuela bypass sanctions. He was stopped in Cape Verde, detained, taken off the train plane. He was a diplomat with diplomatic papers, which were provided on a fake in Interpol warrant given the next day, he was tortured, held in dark, separated from his family, and the regional human rights court got him out of jail eventually and ordered him released and a, pay him an indemnity of $200,000 on March 15th last year. And there's a lot of litigation. He was very well defended. And on the 16th of October, he was sent to the US. And what they wanted? They wanted to get information on how he's, bought, how he's um, helping bypass sanctions. So this is what we're talking about. I mean, his case is a horrible, horrible thing. I have his book uh, right in front, right behind me. I won't get it because I'll probably knock over my, my microphone. Can, can you repeat uh, his name? I mean, the yeah, Alex, Sam, I'm gonna get the book. Uh, hang on, please. Yeah, it sounds interesting. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but since we're talking about tools of uh, fighting sanctions, uh, this might be a resource that 
our listeners can. Here it is. Here it is. Saab, S A A B. Okay. Yeah, Alex Saab. And actually, his case is a very important and in, in, in related to what your country is facing, what we faced with the Meng Wanzhou case in Vancouver. And this man is, his book uh, is, is, it's very touching because he's solid in solidarity with Venezuela and fighting against sanctions. And uh, in Sanctions Kill, we are supporting Alex Saab. And well, I could carry on about this, but the time is flying. It's, what is it, eight? It's uh, 6.15 here in Montreal, 6.15 on the East, East Coast. And um, so, see, I don't really know how to fight sanctions, except that countries in their sovereign way learn to do it. I mean, you know the stories about Iran sending oil. The U.S. stopped one, one, one freighter, and then last June, I think three Iranian oil, uh, uh, what's the term, boats, I can't remember the term. They 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 got to uh, Venezuela and the U.S. We were scared they were going to stop them, and, and they didn't. So this is kind of what, uh, and I'm sure that people from Ethiopia and from the ministry and from the economy in, in your country are are. I hope they're getting ready to study this. I'm sure they are. If they're if they are as intelligent and resourceful as the people attending these meetings, they must have a pretty good idea of what they're going to do. Obviously, we have to support them. Thank you. All right, Deacon uh, Yosef, I believe. Uh, yeah, Deacon Yosef. Uh, it looks like we're coming to our end, and uh, <clears throat> and so I so I don't come back, and then I just wanted to address some things. Uh, but we've been in the session for three hours now, and truly, truly appreciate the, 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 all the panelists. I learned a lot. I think there are a um, few actionable uh, plans that we can walk away uh, with. Um, maybe what we should do is uh, get together uh, privately and uh, see how we can be able to come up with um, actionable platform for. Um, um, our constituents to uh, to participate in. Uh, we understand um, that the level of uh, sanctions are different every time um, it, because uh, it, there's a low level of sanctions to threaten and intimidate and if it doesn't work, it, they go to the next level, including embargoes and and making even a criminal act for for private organizations uh, and individuals to be part of, which I believe uh, John just described uh, the case of Alex Saab uh, is based on. Um, we don't want, obviously, the relationship to get to that level uh, and for it to be continuously uh, uh, becoming damaging uh, for, for Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, and for the region at large. And so I want to say uh, that, that that we really do want to, you know, they are very surprised about our constituents um, visibly going out and protesting and whatnot. If you recall uh, when Iraq was, uh, uh, war was uh, launched, uh, Iraqi Americans were so intimidated, so intimidated that, that they did not, uh, they did not protest. We didn't see them as we have, we see um, today, and that's that's true also for Libya. When their country was bombed back to the Stone Ages, um, you did not see the protests that Ethiopians and American um, um, and Eritreans are jointly are doing now. Uh, just uh, let me pause for a second to turn the lights on. <clears throat> So I, I, I do want to congratulate uh, Ethiopian Americans and Eritrean Americans to really show our resolute and we're not afraid. And this is a new phenomenon. I want you all to understand that. Uh, and uh, what we've done also in Virginia, 
uh, we have flexed our political capital in some way to be registered. The Ethiopian American Civic Council, you know, we we campaign uh, yeah, diplomatic uh, uh, di- campaigns all the time. And uh, Roger Irvin, um, our lobbyist, uh, and Joe McClossey, um, you know, we we closely monitor this. Uh, and when we walked to state the State Department uh, about two months ago, three months ago, um, before we finish our meeting, we kind of say to them, you know we vote. You know we're now targeting Virginia. You know you um, could lose this, <laughs> the Senate um, because we're coming after you in Georgia. And obviously what we saw, and these are very senior people at the State Department, where they were preplexed and they did not anticipate our resolute in, in all of these fronts. So this is a good thing. I think we should continue with that. Um, The other thing that I just want to pinpoint is that we're living not in 1991. Somebody need to tell, um, you know, these policymakers, this is not 1999 when TPLF was enshrined by the United States to take over the federal government. The Soviet Union was collapsing. There are no, were no regional powers. The United States was the sole superpower. And fast forward to the present. Things have changed. So much so, you know, you follow the same news as I do. And today we're hearing the fact that uh, that uh, China's uh, um, economic output has surpassed of that of the United States by a tune of $30 trillion. And that regional powers are now really are the shakers and movers of geopolitics. Russia is, you know, back from the dead. And that the Emirates, the Turks, sway a lot of persuasion in so many ways. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the United States needs to be careful to how much they want to push this because the space that they would leave will not remain being vacant. It will not be a vacuum. Some other powers capable will take advantage of it. You can't lose things you never had. So all these competing powers, they didn't have that sway that they had in the region as the United States did. So in this game, at the end of the day, it's United States to lose. So they need to cherish this. We're bound to complete the GERD. We're going to be a power generating nation. We're gonna align our interest with Eritrea and Somalia. And the epicenter of the region is going to be in these nations. Red Sea control, of, at least in a meaningful way, if you think one one country by itself, you can quarantine it and economically suppress it as they did with Eritrea, would not give them the leverage to have control over the Red Sea. Wait until you see the joint cooperation between these countries, because they are destined. They're, 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 they're people in so many ways, and for most people that don't understand, Ethiopians and Eritreans, we are one people, okay? We happen to have two countries. And and, and this essence, this understanding in the region and whose hand it will fall and whose global interest it may serve, the United States policymaker need to seriously consider and think about whether sanction is a good way for them to get about in making their point. So... I want to say, I really want to thank, uh, I, I know there's a lot of things that we can talk about, but I'd like to thank uh, the organizers. Um, 
Asqual, you've done a phenomenal job in putting together this really uh, powerful uh, webinar. And I want to thank Ann Garrison um, and John for you to be the bridge for us um, to break out from our own ethno center and to assimilate more to the, the general community and to people like yourself who truly have a wherewithal in dealing with these sanctions. All of these illustrious examples that John shared, you know, I, I suppose sanction didn't start on Ethiopia. You know, we all wake up when it happens to us. You know, where were we when, when, when they evaded Iraq? We thought it wouldn't affect us. Where were we when we saw Libya being destroyed or Syria being Yemen or Somalia for that matter? But when it happens to us, first of all, it feels different. The second thing is that we think that they created sanction out of, you know, a thin air just to, to, to make life difficult for us. No, the truth is it has happened. It has been utilized. It's been weaponized. And the history that John shared truly explained to all of us that this is our turn. Now we got to fight the good fight. And so I, I just want to say that this webinar is the first one that, you know, I, us definitely doing it for the first time. It may be the first time that uh, our uh, civic organizations around the country um, have tried to establish uh, for the first time. And with that, we need to continue to broaden the coalition, even to bring in more forces um, to reckon with this crisis that is unfolding before our eyes. Uh, one more thing, Ethiopian American Civic Council, um, with uh, the generous support of many, many of you um, who have supported us, who have financed us, who you have underwritten our ability to be able to hire um, lobbying firm, uh, public relation firms for us to be on the news wire and so that we get our, um, our voice to be heard globally um, we are now finishing up the, the, the year, um, and I believe um, in the week, December 30, and let me just check the day. Um, yeah, uh, we may do it um, on, a, on a Sunday. That would be January 2nd, an annual report of all our work that we have done, and I hope you also join us uh, at that moment. Um, but I want to thank you again. Uh, this is a very, very, very important time that we are living. History is unfolding before our eyes. Uh, the second Adwa, and for you know, for some of you who don't know what Adwa is, please, it's spelled as A D W A. It is a historical battle between Ethiopia and Italy, where we won in a European army, and 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 really. Uh, shattering this indispensable power that the Europeans had on Africa. And I guess we're living again on that battle today. And the exception is that we're not just fighting one country. It's, it looks like a number of countries altogether. So with that, I want to thank you um, serving this and supporting this, advancing this, not only all our coasts, but Africa and the descendant of all Africans around the world, it is in part is actually serving God himself. So I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and uh, God bless all of you. God bless uh, Ethiopia for in, 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 in his, with his mercy um, as he's always been with, with us all along. Uh, I pray um, that you also forsake us for this um, for this uh, historic battle that we're going through. Thank you, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, have, have, have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll follow up. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Aluta continua. Participants, stay Salute on. Salute to, to all our viewers. Yes. And we will do this again soon.
All right. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thanks, um, everybody. Really good appreciate night. Yes. Okay. Bye, Dr. Good night. Good night. You, John, much appreciated. Yeah, you know, John. Well, no, I, I'm impressed by you as a group. You, you personally and the group. Oh, well, thank you, John. Much appreciated. God bless you for all the things you do for the voiceless. Yes, thank you. All right. Good night, guys. Thank okay, you. Okay, you're gonna share your YouTube video with everybody. We're yes. Reading for yes, that. we will. And then we can uh, study and make it a case study and go forward. Okay, well, yeah, Melissa was supposed to talk to us a little bit about mental health, but we're going to do another program. You're going to do another program, Elias, with her as well, right? Definitely, yeah. Uh, we have yeah. something planned in the pipeline. Yeah, that that um, artwork was really very consistent with what everybody was saying about anti-colonialism and, and the strengths of traditional, you know, cultural institutions and stuff like that. So I was most excited about getting to the artwork <laughs> and then the artwork behind you, Yusak's artwork. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean so, me or? Uh... Behind us, you see, you yeah. see that? So, which also is consistent with the fact that the people who suffer in war and atrocities are always women. Who uh, suffer the most great women. work. Who's the artist? That's my husband. Yusak, for oh. Yeah, he's a really good artist. Uh, awesome. Isaac Fine Arts, I'll send you the link. And this is really about, I mean, this piece you can see, you can see the tanks behind. I don't know if it's, it's yeah. clear. Yeah, yeah. The so light. About the Derg, huh? Yeah, well, war, you know, so yeah. the war. The and, horror of war, yeah. Yeah, it has a shape of Africa. You could see it as a shape of Africa. Oh. That's, That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, when you zoom in, you could see that uh, basically it's it's the woman that's carrying the burden of, of all of it. Um, mm -hmm. her children. Um, he's trying to like she's trying to breastfeed, but there's nothing to breastfeed because it's all dried out. Wow. Here it's, it's I don't know if you can see, but it's all dried out. Everything's dried out because of the war and the tanks. And mm -hmm. basically, here are the tanks. The tanks are here burning. They're burning up the mountain. Yeah, I see, I see them now. You're right. Yeah, burning them all up. Um, like the TPLF is doing, burning everything up. Yeah. And it's and there's the woman. Look at her. Is it oil or ac acrylic? Oil on, it's oil on. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. oil on canvas. This all is right. Oil. Very beautiful. Ah. <laughs> and on the bottom of it, it says Psalms 150. Uh, Mazmura Dawid, oh. and verse 102. It makes you read that. And, uh, you know, David always talks about being abandoned, and, but the Lord helping him. Mm -hmm. And so here also the woman is walking. Mm. You see it? What? Yeah, yeah, I, I see that, yeah. Two children. And then um, the children in the middle is silhouette. You can't see him. There's a children in the front and the back, mm, but mm. the one is gone, as if he doesn't exist anymore. Powerful, powerful. It is really powerful piece. I'll send you a picture. S send of us the link. Does he have like a website or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he does. I I I'll send it to you. Yeah. So. There's some amazing African artists, Ethiopian artists, that I, really to me it's like they're more kind of um, aware and philosophically exactly where the world is and the things that we're thinking and questioning. Yeah, and yeah. Doing it in art. And, and that's why I had that one, those two images. I actually bought Kirubel because I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I'm living through right now, you know, yeah. what he was depicting on his art. And I'm just amazed at how it just, they're so, the Ethiopian artists are, are just so aware. I mean, yeah, what, philosophical. Huh? And it speaks to you because they're going through the same experiences that we're all going through. So we have a collective experience. And they are able to, yeah. The inspiration comes from that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, they're, but they're amazing Ethiopian artists right now. And I think that they're so undervalued. It know, is, yes. Yeah like you can buy them for and 
so I think it's really important also for us to to take a look at, at, at them and not just, you know, we read and, and all this stuff, but the artists are telling us a lot too. Exactly. We need to promote, highlight their pieces. Yeah. Social media. and uh, tells their, their yeah. story, our story. Exactly. I agree. <laughs> so we don't do the writing, but they kind of, and it's very, art is very powerful. Like that's very powerful. Yeah. I have a good artist friend in Seattle. Um, his name is Yigzao, Yigzao Mikhail. Over, we organized a show in San Francisco Bay Area. At okay. Gallery One. I don't know. I, my husband curated it and we had him over actually. Uh, we oh, there. so you know him? Yeah. We <laughs> He's a great him. artist also. Yeah. Yes, he was here with us showing a couple of years ago. A yeah. few years back when, when we brought uh, Glenn Ford to the Eritrean Festival. My wife uh, framed this beautiful, I don't know if you can see it, it's yeah, way at the back, yeah. yeah. He, call, he calls it the horn musician, beautiful art. So we, we kind of uh, gave to him as a, as a gift, a, uh, a special signed poster framed nicely. And to, yes. to the day that he died, he, whenever I called him, he said, yeah, I have that, I have the painting at the back of of my office so yeah we, we we have great artists that we need to promote yeah yeah and um so i think that's great recording stopped oh i didn't realize it was still recording uh, well that's good we're talking about art it's important <laughs> it <Right>? is important <laughs> i didn't know that uh that this was being aired live on oh it was being aired <laughs> you're live now so i'm gonna stop the live stream and i'm gonna yeah. Say goodbye, but not a real goodbye. We'll no, no. He, again yeah, with our program. webmaster did, uh, did stop it, I think. So so I let me show you, I want to show you my, this is my Addis Ababa. Can you see it behind oh. me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can't see it. It's a bit far, but. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's Addis, it's Addis Gazah again. And ah, uh, who painted it? Adis Gaz Gazahagen. Uh -huh. So he's a well-known artist in Addis. And I was telling us, well, when I went to the Hyatt, he had a huge painting. It's very like this, but more of the buildings in uh, the lobby of the Hyatt. But this guy is my absolute favorite who, let's see if I turn the light on. You see this one? This is Simeon Mountains. Yeah, yeah. And in this guy's very interesting. His name is Lekun Nahusene, and he writes in Amharic in secrets in his paintings. The only thing I can read is Ras Dashan. Like uh. Ras Dashan. <laughs> you know? And then this is the other one of his, which is Sleeping Beauty, which to me is like Ethiopia, you know, Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, amazing. Beautiful. Right? With very yeah. African marks. It's, this one in the back is also my husband, uh, but I don't know if you can see it. It's over yeah. life size. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, what is it? I was curious. It's oh, uh, wow. oh, that is huge. It is. It's it's rapture, um, and also a lot of people thought that it was the 9/11 uh, when people <laughs> were falling down. But that's the uh, Gondar and Aksum. The Aksum mm -hmm. statues are behind that. But yeah, um, that was a huge. It's how big? That's as it big is. It fills the whole wall. It had to be professionally installed. <laughs> Fantastic. So anyway, I'm going to say goodbye because I think some people are still here. But I'm really, really happy. This has been like uh, I that went really well. well. That was excellent. Great, great webinar. It was uh, how was the attendance? I think it was are. great. I mean, 600 people, 667 people registered. Yeah, also on the YouTube and Facebook. I think and you have a lot of people on YouTube as well. Um, so let me let me check the, the Facebook. It's reached globally, yeah? Huh? It was. It yeah. was global. I mean, a couple of, you know, the panelists joined us from Ethiopia. That was nice. Um, so, so Lawrence Freeman was from Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, he, he, he just was, was back a couple of days ago. But oh, so he's he, back in the U.S. now. 
his back. So he, he, we organized for him to go because there's <laughs> there's no reporting that said otherwise. And so we try yeah. to do we send a couple of other journalists well, as well. They haven't published yet, but we sponsor that. We actually find journalists and send them. That's a good move, yeah. yeah Very he, important. He was really good. Yeah, he's really good. He's really good to Ethiopia. So and yeah, so that's great work. Huh? EACC is really doing amazing things. I'm so impressed. Silently, but they are very <laughs> effective. Um, they're very effective, really. I really love, you know, so the um, the Facebook streaming reached 7,225. That's huge. It is huge, the reach. So many people may have attended momentarily or not. The active ones are 163. And we have uh, 120 shares. Fantastic. Can you imagine it doesn't? Later, no? Huh? Can't people watch it later? Yeah, yeah all the time. Yeah. And then, yeah. And if you, uh, I don't know, um, Elias, do you know anyone? I was going to talk to you offline that can help us do, like, if you know anyone, we can even hire them excerpts of clips and video so we can actually use it for. Promotion. For promotional purposes. Knowledge, especially what Paul talked about. I thought that was very, very serious. It, it, it was very incredible. And how do we fight sanctions? It's not just to have a webinar, but what are the actionable mm -hmm. items? How do we go forward fighting sanctions? We need to focus on that. So his will be really, really good and valuable. Yeah, so let me know which excerpts you want. And, uh... Dr. Barre. Yeah, okay. And John, I think separately. Phenomenal, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's doable. Uh, I'll talk to my colleagues, uh, especially our uh, technical web webmaster, right. see if he can excerpt these two two or three videos like that. Oh my God! It would be it would be wonderful. Um, I don't know how to thank you really, and we need to. Uh, program together going forward. Next one's going to be hosted by you. We're all in this together, Raskwan. Yes, yes. That's it, really, it really touched me what you said about we want to fight for Ethiopia next, because we didn't uh, go through this it. Is, this and is an existential I like, fight. I like what Diggon yes. said, we are one people. Exactly. We are one blood. Eritreans and Ethiopians are the most related. Even they did a gene study, mm. found out how closely related we are. It's just fascinating. It's just everything, our DNA, our blood, our food, our culture, our music, our clothes. It's one people, really. It's true. Exactly. Super, separated by ideology. As and sometimes times of crisis like this have uh, an amazing way of, of bringing people together uh, we have also in, in our respective communities a lot of uh, good bridge builders. Yes, that gosh, like, like, like you guys. No, I haven't. I wouldn't be able to do. We wouldn't be able to do this with Gasha Lazar and Atiyeke. Yes. They are. They are the ones that actually good keep people. Us really, yeah. Oh my God, leadership wise. And I was invited to be a keynote speaker in one of their events in. Um, in Oakland, I went there to visit the facility. Uh, the center, the Eritrean yes. Cultural yes. Civic Center. Yeah. Okay. yeah. At um, the annual celebration of the liberation. No, I, I missed that one. Okay, I was I was there. I spoke there. Yeah. Um, and so how they found me was it was interesting because we we Dina and I were the speakers for the March rally in San Francisco. Yeah, the, I, there I, I was there. I saw and you then. So, yeah, and so after that, I started actively tweeting. So I did uh, the General Filippo, um, you know, face. So I changed my icon my to that. And I, I kept advocating and uh, tweeting. And so a lot mm -hmm. of Air Turn Americans started contacting me after that. Wait, what was it that made them contact you? General Filippo. General Filippo was the yes. one. The uh, Eritrean chief of staff was put on uh, sanctions. Uh, Magnitsky as act sanctions. Yeah. Just a few months ago, I believe around August was it or beginning of September. 
mm-hmm. by the US. Yeah. So so you put his picture as your profile. I changed uh, my icon to his yeah. profile. And okay. um, I kept, uh, you know, tweeting, cat tagging people. And basically what it said was, uh, you know, why are you sanctioning him? It, it said it was very profound. Actually, I think I... Um, yeah, I missed that one. <laughs> oh, you did? I'll send it. I, I'll, to you. I'll find it and retweet it. <laughs> I, I will send it to you. And yeah, so please do. What it, 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 what it said was, General Filippos of Eritrea is a soldier with integrity and discipline who owns zero in foreign banks, mm. Mr. President, instead sanctioned TPLF terrorists who stole 30 billion in foreign aid money. I think I saw that tweet. Oh, no, I just love it. I love it. <laughs> then, yeah. you know, um, you. because I was so upset and I felt that was like my father, my older brother, like how could, how could they do this? You know, yeah. not a lot. Uh, a form of imperialism. Um, and um, I was just, so I, I'm glad I, I connect a lot of Etra Americans that way. Well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why we're not connected more, you know? I, I know, like, when I used, when I was tweeting about TPLF and at one point they shut them down on the internet and Twitter, like, yeah, 2016. The Eritreans were the only ones that were still there. So, you know, it was like, I was like, okay, they're, at least they're there, you know, because the Ethiopians were just shut down and then the Ethiopians were oppressed. So, you know, I, I definitely noticed that it was the Eritreans that were doing all the anti-TPLF and then me and, and, and a few other people. But yeah, the Ethiopians, I mean, I think that's... It took a while, yeah. Yeah, because TPLF was oppressive. I mean, they really cracked down. So, brutal. Brutal, uh, yeah. And what's interesting, I thought, and I, I, I was going to comment, but we didn't have enough time, is when um, uh, Dieg Ontafari said, he mentioned something about, they almost resent us for not having been colonized. And in fact, that's what they say about, um, what's her name? Gail Smith, that she has a particular animosity you know, towards mm-hmm. anybody who won't bow down to U.S. empire. And she has been particularly vicious, you know. It goes way back, yeah. She, she yeah. goes way back to the early 1980s. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, I, I saw the photo, I was like, I could not believe it. And Samantha Powers also, there's some articles on Counterpunch about how really disturbing she is, like her sense of mm. megalomania and this whole sense of like the U.S. Mm. virtuous and it's like no you're not you're there to take you know and <laughs> it's where does she and you know sometimes it's like they have psychological issues as a lot of these megalomaniacs and she's mm. one of the ones that really is concerning Mm. Yeah, you can read. You can read through that because you're an adult psychiatrist. You can tell, right? It's <laughs> written about, writ, and I haven't read it because I, I mean I don't have any, you know, interest in her as a person. But that she's written about her anxiety disorders and her needing help, and it's like, yeah, no wonder because it's manifesting as anxiety. But what it is is, you know, that you have caused the death massacres and massacres of children, you know? And that's what I always struggle with. How do these people reconcile that, you know? Mm-hmm. Madeline Albright said, yeah, thousands of Are we on my- kids have died due to sanctions. Uh, uh, Go ahead. I think we should, uh, Okay. are we still s- streaming? No, uh, maybe he was, I stopped my Facebook. Oh, I don't have Facebook, so. Oh, no, on, on, okay, so on the I, Horn of Africa. Oh, well, I don't know. They would have to stop it. Um, let's see here. Let me. Let me see if I can. Anyway, that went really well, Asqua. I thought that was great. It was, yeah. There was a couple of disturbance, and what happened is a couple of people logged in with a different name. They're, you mean at the beginning? Yeah, well, 
kind of in the middle. They were posting with a fake name, but they registered with one name and they were disturbing in chat with a different name. So I kind of figured out and I started oh. kicking out people with initials. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. Weird. Okay, let's uh, go off and then we can talk offline. How about that? Yeah, I think. I'm going to let you guys go. Thank so you. Uh, good on. night. Great. Uh, uh, like this. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.